today on the new Dr. Phil. Well, I don't even know where this is all going. Are you okay with that? Yes, you are. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Get your hand up, up. What you've just seen is an alleged murder for hire plot exposed during a police sting. What you don't know is that police say the woman on the surveillance tape is a mother-in-law paying a hitman to kill her daughter-in-law and her grandchildren. If you think you've seen in-laws cross the line, you're not going to believe what you see today. A mother-in-law caught on tape, accused of putting a hit. Really evil people. On her own family. The hitman was supposed to kill us by shooting us in the head, take pictures, and then give them to his parents. Did you see this coming at all? Plus, she says her mother-in-law attacked her. She broke my throat. Find out why she's the one who went to jail. Did you say, you crazy I'm going to take you down? I did not. Did you say you don't have the to divorce her? I told him he needed to grow some. <laughs> Start telling the truth. It's a pack of lies. We're going to get to the bottom of this right now. Come here. Let's do it. I want you to get excited about your life. Here we go. Stand by, camera set. If you're going to talk to me, you're going to have to be on. Stand by, Dr. Phil. Showtime. This is going to be a changing day in your life. Stand by, A. And relay. Check in. Go, Dr. Phil. around America, you just never know what goes on behind closed doors, behind the white picket fence, the manicured lawns. On the outside, everybody puts on a good face. I mean, think about it. Life looks just peachy keen, right? We all go to church and everything's fine. You look at your neighbor next to you right now, everything looks fine. But then some people can wind up looking Wonderful one minute, and a whole lot different the next. That is your mugshot, right? And this happened after you and your mother-in-law got into a huge fight, mm -hmm. and she called the cops and had you arrested, fingerprinted, and booked, correct? Yes. And she says that you attacked her, grabbed her arm, made her bleed, and pushed her down to the floor. You say she attacked you holding one of your children and tried to choke you. Yes. Right? Absolutely. Okay. This isn't good. No. This isn't good. Let's take a look at this story. Ted and I have been married for just over seven years and have two beautiful children. When did you be happy? My mother and my wife actually got along very well. We were very, very close. When our oldest daughter was born, it was absolutely the turning point. Any decision that involves my daughter, my mother would like to control. Catherine disagrees with us on almost every aspect of how we choose to raise our children, whether it's what they eat, when they nap, how long they nap for. My mother-in-law definitely feels that I'm not a proper wife and mother. It's built a lot of tension. I bit my tongue for a long time. The day that Maria and I had our altercation changed my life. On that day, I had come downstairs. She had breast augmentation done. Maria was complaining that she felt Ted was having an affair. I walked in the kitchen and she said, he's been effing his girlfriend all week. It really startled me, the language that she was using in front of the children. She began yelling at me, saying that I didn't deserve Ted, that I didn't deserve the children, and that she would do whatever she had to do to take my children from me. Through the entire altercation, she was holding my one-year-old daughter. I managed to break away from her, and she got behind me and shoved me down on the kitchen floor. She slipped, and she fell. I said, Maria, what is wrong with you? She told me that I was a piece of shit. 
I wasn't a good wife, a good person. I pushed her against the wall. She could have grabbed my arm, my shirt, my hair, but she didn't. She grabbed my throat. She reached and dug her nails into my arm, puncturing my arm pretty severely. Blood started running. I was scared, I was nervous, but I made up my mind as God is my witness. It'll be over my dead body before I leave those children in there with her. When I called home, I was just shocked to hear what was going on. She began referring to my wife as a crazy bitch, and my wife began to refer to my mother as an old crazy bitch. My mother said, you're a crazy bitch, I'm going to bring you down. I got home, I called 911 and told the lady I did need to talk with the policeman. When I opened my door and saw the police officer, I was terrified. He said he was arresting me for assault and battery. They had fingerprinted me, and I think the first time I lost it was when they were getting ready to take my mug shots. I just kept thinking, I am a mother to two beautiful children. I have a career. I live in a beautiful home. I'm, I look like I'm trash. I put my life on the line that day and I would do it again. My mom really thrives on being the victim. The judge said I was guilty. It was my word against my mother-in-law's, and I was the liar. That's why she convicted me, and that's hard to swallow, because I was the one telling the truth that day. I feel that I did the right thing by calling the police. Dr. Phil, my daughter-in-law, physically attacked me. Please get her some help. Well, Maria is currently on a $1,500 personal recognizance bond and needed a judge's permission to travel to the show today. Now, her mother-in-law, Catherine, is backstage right now, and she's listening to everything that's going on, and we're going to bring her out in a little bit. You wrote the letter. Yes, sir. Uh, tell me why you wanted to be here and what you want to accomplish today. Uh, I'd like to see my mother get some help into knowing how to, to treat my wife properly and to admit what's happened in this situation and to be honest about it. And what would she admit if she admitted what happened in this situation? I, I do not believe the police should have been involved. And I think if mother would just admit that, uh, it would be the beginning of, of getting us all some help. Well, but your mother says that you took her to the magistrate. No, that's not correct. I, I did uh, go to see how my mother was doing. The police officer that had been there had left and had talked to me on the phone and let me know that my mother would have to go to the magistrate's office in order to press charges. Um, I was actually there at her home when some photographs were being taken, and my mother then uh, from, was taken to the magistrate's office by an officer, and I picked her up and brought her back home. At well, the whole you... time, she said she never pressed charges against my wife and still contends that to this day. Okay, now we'll get back to your where you need to be in this and where you have been in this. But I guess my first question to you is, what are you doing rolling around in the floor with your mother-in-law at your house? It was a situation that never should have happened, obviously. The whole thing would have been over had she, I asked her numerous times to leave and give me my daughter. And she was refusing to give me my one-year-old daughter. Um, at no time did I intend to harm her. All I was doing was trying to get my daughter from her. And there's somebody in your home threatening <clears throat> you and your children. Your natural reaction when someone's holding your baby and refusing to give them to you is to well, Do you have harder. a temper? Oh, sure. Because she says, and your sister says, that you've told them that Maria gets upset, throws things, like the telephone, has hit you, has called you bastard, C word, P word. So y you say you just instinctively grabbed her arm. After she, when she had my throat, yes. And you did what? I grabbed her arm from my throat. Yeah. Grabbed her and set, put her arm down and said, don't you ever do that to me again and let go. And as soon as I let go, she swung at me and I had to back away with my children. Um, and immediately ran up and upstairs and locked me and my children into a room to get away from her. So you got a 70-year-old mother-in-law who's swinging at you. Yes. Is this happening in the kitchen or the den? It's or happening in the breakfast area. In the breakfast area. And where are you when all this is going on? You're at work or you're, well, I was you're on gone? My, I was on my way back home from a business trip. And actually, I called to see how things were at the home and heard some of the arguing going on. But I didn't call until after some of this had taken place. And what scared me is that it's not the first time my mother has actually said, you know, if Maria speaks to me like that again, I'm going to slap her face. And she said that numerous times in the past. And so 
there, there's some of this that rings a bell to me, but when I called and heard both of them you know, yelling at each other, it was just, I, I can't imagine telling you how shocked I was. Well, all right. Maria says her mother-in-law uh, threatened to reveal something today that will ruin her life. Uh, we're going to add her to the mix next. She's headed this way. We'll be right back. It's horrible to be treated like a common criminal. The most humiliating moment was probably when I first got there, I asked the officer if I could use the restroom. And mind you, I'm in paper-thin pants. There's no toilet paper. The only thing I had to improvise was my sleep. I didn't want to walk in there looking like I'd wet my pants. It was horrifying. never forgive her for what she's done. Catherine would say she spit on someone because their skin looked dry. She just won't take responsibility for anything that she does. I absolutely don't believe a single bit she was trying to help me. She told a pretty good story in court. It was made for television, basically. And it would have been called Catherine the Great. Well, today we're talking about in-law conflicts that have had criminal consequences. I'm going to put in for hazardous duty pay today. I may get choked or clawed or something. I hope not. 29-year-old Maria was found guilty of assaulting her 73-year-old mother-in-law, Catherine, and spent several hours in jail after leaving the elderly woman with bleeding wounds. Now, Catherine says her daughter-in-law, Maria, has a violent temper and fears that she's a danger to her son, Ted, as well as her grandchildren. Uh, Catherine, yes. what, what's, what's going on here? Right now, I'm in shock that, first of all, they would say the things that they just said. What in particular was offensive um, to your sensibilities? The fact that Ted said that he didn't suggest that I report the incident. In fact, he said, you have to report this incident. Okay, but let me ask something. Multiple times you were asked to leave. Why didn't you just leave and avoid the confrontation? Because I was worried about my grandchildren. She displayed a temper that I have never seen before, except so, the time that she did tell me to get the F out of her house. So you actually believed that this woman was going to attack and injure these two children? I really wasn't sure, Dr. Phil, but I know that she had had breast augmentation, she was wrapped in gauze, and was told not to lift more than five pounds. Yeah. And I wanted to stay there until my son got there. He asked me to stay with them. Did, did you object to her having breast augmentation? Because that's the fourth time you've mentioned it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I breastfed two children for a total of two years and look like, you know, <laughs> like a science project. So, hence my... Yeah, I mean, well, that, did no, you not like sir. that? I think it's a voluntary thing. I think it's something we okay, choose well, I just wondered because you, you, you kept mentioning it. No. Uh, uh, Ted says that you have a need to control every decision about the children and that you are just overbearing and domineering and asserting your will about that. That's false. That's false. Yes, sir. Why would you say that about your mother? Uh, it's, it's just a, it's a fact. And I love my mother and I hate that this has happened, but I really want that to change. I want her to respect the fact that I may look at something with my children or Maria, and we make, make a decision with our kids that's dramatically different than how you would do it. But we love our children. Maria would never attack those children, and you know that, Mama. I am amazed that having brought this young man up with the high values, principles, and ethics that I feel I brought him up with, that he would, would come on stage here and tell people that I would do those things. As God is my witness, I have never interfered, to my knowledge. Well, I've got two really burning questions for you, because I want to give you a chance to talk about all of this. Now, I'm going to take a break first. Ted claims that he stands by his wife, but I'm wondering if he's playing both sides and creating 
more of a problem here than he's fixing. We'll be right back. Maria has taken her temper tantrums out on Ted. He said she'd thrown the telephone at him. She's a drama queen. She has called him some very vulgar names. Children don't need to see that. To me, that's trash. My in-laws have a very twisted sense of honor. They have always lied to protect one another, but kill children? All their secrets are going to come out. The whole world's going to know how twisted and dysfunctional they really are. It's so sick and sad and evil. Ted said, you have to report this mom. I never dreamed she'd do this to you. And I think Ted took his mother's side. She snipped, and I guess I'll have to involve the police. I did not take it seriously. Ted stated that Maria's statement had changed four or five times. And again, he said in court, Mom's statement had changed four or five times. I really don't know. Well, bloody attacks, arrests, mug shots, undercover stings. But this is not an episode of Cops. This is the Dr. Phil show. And we're talking about in-laws, family, families that come together, merge together, and live in harmony by design. Ted says that the relationship between his wife, Maria, and his mother, Catherine, is often a sick competition, and he is tired of being trapped in the middle. Now, you, you said in your best Virginia accent, God is my witness. I'll never be hungry again. No. Um, <laughs> you, I mean, it, I, I don't, it, it is hard for me to picture you uh, choking somebody, swinging on them, and wrestling in the floor, but that did happen, right? You, there, you were wound up in the floor. I was pushed in the kitchen, into the kitchen floor. The first, the first thing that happened... Did you choke her? No, sir. Did, did you take had a swing I, at her? Had I wanted to hurt her, I could have hit her in her breast. I could have... <laughs> well, no. That's five times. That's okay. No, but That's you right. could have hurt her if I you wanted really, to, but... Dr. Phil, I could have harmed her. But I tried to keep her refrained or restrained from me because she did. She pushed me on the kitchen floor. She got behind me when I got up and sat on a chair and shoved my left shoulder into the, in a coffee cup and coffee flew. Did you say that she's a horrible mom and doesn't deserve to be married to your son? No, because did, Maria did you, is a good mother. Did you say to her, you crazy bitch, I'm going to take you down. No, sir. You didn't and say there that. there again, I'll tell you, as God is my witness, I did not say that. Did you say uh, to your son, you don't have the balls to divorce her? No, and sir. And that's what you need to do. No, sir. I Ted? told him he needed to grow some. <laughs> Dr. Phil, God... <laughs> Because I'm gonna, I've got. No, I, I, I want you to. Um, did, um, did you say to one of the children, "Where do you get that temper from?" I guess it's from the woman who did this to my arm, and that's your mother. No, sir. You did not say. Did no, I did not. Heard verbatim. God is my witness. I'm from Virginia too. <laughs> uh, you did say that, and you said it in the house, right there in front of both children. Now start telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. Tell the truth, mother. I'm telling you. Okay. You said that right in front of the children. No, I did not. So you didn't say any of that stuff. So are they just, I mean, this is your own son that's making this stuff up about you? Wonder um, why he's doing that. I, I don't know. Could be really an arrest know. augmentation. <laughs> 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 You got that right. But, uh, why, is he, why is he saying those things you about know, you? I don't know. I, 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 I'm actually just in a state of shock over him saying that because when he came in 
I had gone upstairs and there was blood all over everything. And I was like in a state of shock. I was wiping the blood up. Can I see where she got you? Right, there's one of them, right, right like this. And then there was one over here. Okay, so she clawed yes, you right sir. there. Now she says that's why you were choking her. I never tried to choke her. I did put my hand here. And you're gonna hear this again because of the bandage. <laughs> I love this young woman. I don't want her hurt. I don't want well, my grandchildren you, hurt. If you love her, why did you call the law on her and put her in jail? I didn't do it. No, the Commonwealth of Virginia, when the policeman came in, which my son said, you must report this. And I, I hadn't even thought about the police when I was in such a state of shock. Well, I actually spoke to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Okay. And they said that you were the one that called, that you were the witness for the prosecution right. in the trial in July. So you not only were upset that day and called and reported it and filed a complaint, you then went in later no, and, and, and no, sir. you could have you could have dropped the charges. You could have said, No, I don't want to do it. You could you, you put him. your grandchildren's mother in jail. Not I didn't want her put in jail. I was crying. And I told the magistrate, I said, I do not want this woman arrested, and I do not want her picked up. Okay, but the, the people who tend to arrest folks and put them in jail are police and judges. And you contacted both. Because my son asked me to. He said, you must, you must take this to the authorities. Now, and you say that's not true? No. All right, I got to take a break. All right, uh, look. Maria says, I'm not ever going to be able to forgive Catherine uh, for being arrested, and now I've got a permanent record that I have to deal with. Uh, what do they do with all of this, and how do we get out of this mess? I'll be right back. Catherine told me that she had something that would ruin my life. I said, I have taken into account things that you've done. Maria started in with, well, I haven't had an affair. Ted's the one that's having an affair. He's been effing his girlfriend all week. I said, Maria, you sound like a trashy whore. talking about in-law conflicts that are so extreme that they've crossed into the legal arena. Now, Maria's holding a grudge against her mother-in-law, Catherine, ever since she had her arrested for assault. Now, Catherine says she hasn't seen her grandchildren in months, and of course, that's not good if, if you miss them and, and they miss you. So what is it that you're threatening her with to ruin her life? I'm not threatening her with anything. Well, what now, is it you're going to tell me today that's going to ruin her life? I don't want to tell you what, what she said to me. She had, she's 29, almost 30 years old. I don't want her to go the rest of her life having the things that she said to me on national television. I don't want her to say it. You want to just tell me secretly? That would be fine. Okay. All right. She told me. I'm not going to ask you to say it. And I'll tell you what. I'm not going to ask you to say it. Okay. Please. Thank you. There's a lot of different angles here going on. Of course. And it's not, it feels like it's an attack on mom. That is not right. No, no, no. I don't no, want it to no, be an attack on to the other side. or Ted, either one. But the truth of the matter that her arm was horrible, that she needed to file charges, that you took care of that, you helped her home, took the children to the babysitter that Maria had changed her story four or five times, and then in court you said mom had, which both can be true, because in something like that, stuff can come up that you remember later. But right. it's not all one-sided here. No, There's no, I'm just, I'm just, I gotta do them. this a piece at okay. a time. I'm just, it feels like an attack. Oh, no, I'm yeah. headed down to the other right end. I, I love you, them all very much. Yeah, and you're Ted's sister. I am. Kathy, and 
I'll probably talk to you some more okay. in a minute. You all know what I think about this? Yeah. I, I think you guys have gotten into a situation where you've got no boundaries. The fact that you have let a family dispute get to the point that you've turned it over to third-party judicial forces, that's a bad thing. That's inviting the government into your home. And now your daughter-in-law has a criminal record, and she doesn't like that. Sir. You, okay, but let me, let me finish. Let me finish. So somehow or another, this thing has gotten way out of, out of, out of whack. You had the ability to defuse this at the time, but you got angry, correct? Yep. I could have just gone upstairs. Once you get married, right, wrong, or indifferent, fair or unfair, if there is conflict between your mother or your father and your wife, if there's conflict between your mother and your father and your husband, it's your job to fix it. It's your job to fix it. That's your job to sit down with your mother and say, Mom, we've got to have some boundaries here. We don't want you to not be around the children. We don't want the children to not have you around them. But there are some boundaries that you're going to have to respect. And if you violate those, then we're going to have to limit the exposure. Now, what I would implore you to do is pick your battles wisely. The fact that grandmother might do things differently than you would do, I mean, is it really something that you want to fracture the family over? Because let me tell you, there is no love for a child like a grandmother's love. There, I mean, there's, and extended family is so important. Aunts, uh, mothers, th that's so important. I can tell you, uh, Robin and I have two children that are now grown, 27 and 20, and to this day, there is no greater love they have than for their grandmother and their grandmother for them. And she spoils them. Oh, my God, they should be in the penitentiary if they use that value system. <laughs> Cut that out of the show. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, you, you, have to, you have to try to be forgiving and pick your battles when it doesn't really matter. If it doesn't affect the character, the, the focus, the, the, the values of the child, she, she didn't do such a bad job with you. No, the, the she argument is... She did such a bad job with you, right? I no. mean, you turned out relatively okay. That's debatable. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> talking about you've got you've to have the strength to step up and stand up. The question is, can these in-laws ever find resolution and become a family again? My in-laws are conniving, they're evil, that's just part of their everyday existence. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and my husband is obviously sick, so now we know where it's come from. back with in-laws at war. Now, Catherine had her daughter-in-law, Maria, arrested and claims that it was her son, Ted's, I Ted's idea. Now, she says that's not what happened and that's not what she wanted to occur. Now, you have filed an appeal. Yes. And you need to fight that appeal all the way to the Supreme Court of the Commonwealth of Virginia if that's what you have to do. You started something in play here. No, I did not. Well, what, what I did she not. Is that this point, I can't. I can't be in the same room as her for, if, at the best, for two years because I can't put myself in the position that she can call the police on me again, and I can. So that's the issue. My other issue with my children. My children adore her. My children love her. I love those children. She with loves all my, my children, heart. but and I, I love, can't risk I her you, making Maria. comments to my children about me. I cannot do it. I've never said anything to your children. Well, then Ted's Maria, look this happened me in when the I was eye. A, when I was a young man and, and, and my mother you. and father divorced Dr. Phil, said anything she put my father you. down all the time to me. And this is just a repeated behavior. And that really doesn't have anything to do with why we're here today. But, well, but when you're saying does. limiting. But yes. what, what you're saying is if you have to, you have to put up some boundaries there. When you say you didn't start this ball rolling, but when you picked up that phone, and listen, if you're in danger, if you feel you're in danger, you have to do what it takes to protect yourself. And, and Sir, you've been led to believe the wrong thing. Who called 911? 
Catherine? She Catherine. tried to the first time. <laughs> she tried to have me removed. There's a pack of lies that have already been said here. Before I ever came out, there were a pack of lies. Okay, and you've identified every one of those that you thought was, that no, you thought sir. was wrong. No, sir. I, I, I actually was in a state of shock when I viewed them from your blue room. Okay, green. Is there anything... It's blue. I know, but they call it a green room. Is there anything you haven't said that you want to say, that yes, you want sir. to clarify or straighten out? There definitely is. Okay, click them off for me. Because I, w I want to hear him, but we've got to move right along. I did not want her put in jail. Okay. I did not file the suit. The Commonwealth of Virginia filed it. I was only a witness. The judge found her guilty, but she only wanted her to get anger management, which is all I wanted her to do. Get anger management and let everything else go. And in two years, they would wipe her slate clean. And for two years, I'd be walking on eggshells. I feel at the bottom of my heart that I was there for a good reason. I was asked to come and take care of all three of them, the two little girls and Maria, who had just had breast augmentation. <laughs> I love that girl, and she knew I wouldn't mind doing anything to help her. The only reason I'm here is that I prayed about it, and I want her to have some therapy so that the chance that possibly she'll get angry enough to hurt the children will be wiped clean. Okay. And the fact that she did hurt him, <clears throat> wait just a minute. <laughs> I'm a Southern lady and you're a Southern gentleman. That's why I'm and, sitting here right, quiet. So, okay. That's why I'm and sitting it's here not quiet. a funny deal. At well, all. It's a very serious deal to me, one that I have been made to look like a meddling mother in law. You got, do and you, I'm not. Do you have, I have one question for you and then we are moving on. Okay. Do you have any ownership or contribution to the problems that occurred that day? Is there any, any, any fault or blame yes, or responsibility? Sir. Yes, sir. And what, I would did. It, what would it be? It would be that because of what she said to me, it was like putting the flag up in front of a, fo a full red flag. I do not believe in using the F word, the S word, or any of that in front of little children. And she's done it twice, to my knowledge, in front of me. And I've told her that, to me, it's pretty tacky. All right. Now, what did you do wrong, Mama? if, hold on, if I arrange some help to try to decompress this situation and come up with a plan where everybody can coexist peaceably and the children can have access to their extended family, will you participate in that? Certainly. Will, will you participate Absolutely. in that? Absolutely. Will you participate in that? If the court said, look, I'll drop these charges, we'll no bill this, we'll take this whole thing and expunge it from the record if you do anger management, would you do it That's with her? That's what the court offered. Could, would you do it with her? Certainly. Okay. I'm just, I'm not saying, I'm just, I, Let me I'm tell just, you something. I, I've been, I'm 73 years old and I've never, I've never had anyone say that I was so angry I needed to have management. Well, I'm just, I'm saying if you two got in there and worked together, you could maybe find some. I would some, love to. All right. Next. <laughs> A woman whose mother-in-law allegedly plotted to wipe out the grandchildren, the family dog, and her. When you hear this true crime story, you're going to understand how things can get way out of control. My mother and father-in-law are really evil people. My in-laws attempted to hire a hitman to have their grandchildren and me executed. They would rather kill than have their son exposed as a wrongdoer. Today, we're talking to people who say their in-laws can get out of control and things can break down. In some cases, they can actually turn into outlaws, and that's the chilling story that you are about to hear that made headlines across the nation.
Jason is the man I've loved for so long. We've been together for over 11 years. My in-laws have loved and cared about me and the children and my husband especially. A year ago, everything changed. It's devastating. Jason is in jail right now, charged with 44 counts of sexual molestation, rape, and solicitation to commit murder. Murder for hire murder. murder. Conspiracy to commit My murder. in-laws are currently behind bars, waiting for trial for attempted murder. My mother and father-in-law are really evil people. My in-laws attempted to hire a hitman to have their grandchildren and me executed. Count it. Lucky for me, the hitman was an undercover cop. <laughs> my in-laws would rather kill than have their son exposed as a wrongdoer. Both of my daughters came forward and accused my husband of sexually molesting them. My oldest daughter accused my husband of raping her at gunpoint. I felt sick, horrified. My in-laws have a warped way of thinking. They saw my daughter as a traitor. My mother-in-law accused me of betraying my husband. Then, the next thing I know, law enforcement came to me and said there was a plot to have us killed. The children killed, me killed, the dog killed. Law enforcement set up a sting operation. They got my mother-in-law on tape. When I go in there, I'm not even know where this are all going. Are you okay with that? Yes, ma'am. Yes. I saw her on the tape. She told the hitman to kill all four of us. And she even said, I know this sounds cold. This is sounds really cold, Paul. The hitman was supposed to kill us by shooting us in the head, execution style. Take pictures of us and then give them to his parents. Without us to testify, there would be no trial and this all would just go away. Our whole lives have changed. I can't be normal anymore. I am still in fear for my life and my children's lives. I'm afraid that somebody else is gonna come and try to kill us. Dr. Phil, I wanna feel safe. I want my kids to feel safe. Can you please help us? That's just unbelievable to watch. What did you think when they knocked on your door and told you what was going on? I didn't know what to think and um, they told me uh, my husband had put a hit out on me and uh, that we needed to go somewhere, we needed to take the kids, go hide till they could get this worked out. And uh, my immediate thought at that point was that my in-laws had to be involved because they have always been the financiers behind anything my husband's done or had done. Did you see this coming at all? I don't know. I mean, that's a hard question. I want to introduce Dan Conley. And, uh, you were the lead investigator in this case, That's correct? That's correct, doctor. And of course, everybody's pleading not guilty, Nobody, but they've all been charged, right? Yes, sir, they've been charged and they're awaiting trial. All right. What do your children understand about all of this at this point? My children know that, that my husband and their grandparents have a problem, that they aren't normal, that they wanted them dead, and the children are getting help at yes. this point with this. And are they doing well? My oldest daughter is not doing well. But she is in professional care. Yes, and it's not working. Nothing we do is working. All right, well, you have to be patient with this. And I want to monitor this situation, and I want you to let me know what unfolds and how this develops for you and both of your children, because if there are some additional things that might need to be done or can be done, then by all means, we'll step up and see if we can help you with that. That would be wonderful. Right. Now, Versi Jackson's attorney refused to give us a comment. The attorney representing Jason on the conspiracy charges did not return our calls despite numerous attempts. However, his attorney for the molestation charges said Jason Jackson has pleaded not guilty, and as for the father, Robert Jackson, his attorney stated that his client, quote, denies participating in a scheme to murder witnesses offered against his son. He goes on to say, no conspiracy existed for Mr. Jackson to participate in a murder for hire scheme, and that he denies all knowledge of any such plan or scheme. So I wanted to put their side of this in. 
Uh, what would you expect them to say? We've certainly heard your side. We'll be right back. We've been talking today about in-law conflicts, and as I said, things take on more gravity when it's family. But it is worth working on. It's worth every bit of effort, every bit of energy that you can to resolve it, because extended family, grandmothers, grandfathers, all are so important to the evolution of the children. They learn that there's a world outside the family. It's worth working it out. If you have an in-law conflict that's gotten out of control, Go to DrPhil.com. I'm going to list some steps and things there that you can think about to help decompress and defuse the situation. Thanks for being here today. So long. Today on an all new Dr. Phil. She went from ugly duckling to hot tamale. His wife lost 140 pounds. She's too hot. And she may lose her man as a result. My husband is flat out jealous. There's a confrontation almost every time we go out. It's fun having that tension. I'm not gonna lie. Are you giving him reason to wonder? I don't consider myself flirting. Did somebody write stupid on my forehead? <laughs> Plus, she had a load of Audrey. Dr. Phil, is this too hot? She's sexy and 60? Wait, I have a strong libido. And she's got a 28-year-old boyfriend to prove it. She's like the Energizer Bunny. Just keeps going and going and going. Don't hate me because I'm pretty. Hate me because your boyfriend wants me. You say you want to grow old gracefully. Did I read that right? I don't know. I don't have my glasses. Coming up. Let's do it. I want you to get excited about your life. Here we go. Intense. Stand by, camera set. If you're going to talk to me, you're going to have to be honest. Stand by, Dr. Phil. Showtime. This is going to be a changing day in your life. Stand by, A. And roll A. Check it. Go, Dr. Phil. You got it, flaunt it, right? Okay. Well, some of my guests today say they went from ugly, ugly duckling to hot tamale. And people around them say they've gone too far and just gotten too hot. I know it's tough. What are you, what are you gonna do? You'll, you're gonna meet a woman today who says she's lost 140 pounds. And gained an insanely jealous husband because now he thinks she looks way too sexy. All right. Now, we also talked to the winner of the TV show, The Swan, who says she doesn't know how to handle her newfound beauty. And she says she's often mean to men who now approach her. But first, you got to get a load of Audrey. <laughs> now, she says she looks extra hot now that she's in her 60s. And she's got a 28-year-old boyfriend to prove it. All right, take a look. I may be 62 years old, but that doesn't mean I have to dress like it or act like it. I can be a grandma, and I can be hot as well. Audrey's like a mother to me, but when it comes to my children, there's just nothing grandmotherly about her. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She's just a little too eccentric when it comes to her clothing. 
Oh, Crystal doesn't know what she's talking about. Crystal's too old for me sometimes. Make it appropriate. Audrey's clothes are something that you see maybe on an MTV music video. It's just way too much. I don't want anything to do with being a typical grandmother figure. I prefer the young styles and looking young. I enjoy being sexy. Audrey's favorite outfit is a hot pink wig with tiger gloves, a short leather skirt, and it's outrageous. Dr. Phil, is this too hot? Sometimes I get a little too silly, but I'm having fun. When Audrey's wearing her little mini skirts, she's just too hot to drop. People tell me that I have nice legs, so I figure I'm gonna show them off for as long as I can. I've done a little alterations. I had a facelift, a breast augmentation, and I had a butt enhancement. When we're out shopping, everybody just stops and stares. Some will walk by me and say, God, that's ridiculous. Other people will say, boy, she's hot. Boy, I wish I could look like that. When I think of grandmother, I think of homemade cookies. If Crystal thinks I'm gonna start baking cookies, she's dreaming. My boyfriend, Tyler, is 28 years old. Give me a kiss, baby. The first time I ever saw Audrey's boyfriend, Tyler, I was completely shocked. What a good looking cowboy, I thought. He makes me feel good, and he makes me feel sexy, and he makes me feel young. He also has those rugged good looks. I couldn't resist Audrey. There isn't no resisting Audrey when she turns on everything. She's a firecracker. He's two years older than me. That'd be like dating your son. If Demi can date a younger man, so can I. When Audrey gives you the bedroom eyes, you know that the rest of the evening is going to be fun. I have a strong libido, and I'm making up for lost time. She's like the Energizer Bunny. Just keeps going and going and going. I'm living proof that you can be 62 and have a great sex life. I love Audrey's positive energy. I just wanted to start acting her age. I wish I could wear a t-shirt that said, please don't hate me because I'm pretty. Hate me because your boyfriend wants me. <laughs> So what do you what do you think of that kind of overview? I think it's great. Yeah, I love it. So you're having fun. Yes. All right. And have you been this way all your life? No, not all my life. I mean, when did you decide that you were going to be hot, sexy, fun, party girl, pink wig, <laughs> little tiger gloves? Well, maybe my fifties, fifty-five. With 55? I decided to jump out of the box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why then? Why 55? Um, why not? You think this is crazy? Yes, that's nuts. She's crazy. Why? I think she's going through a crisis. <laughs> I think she felt hidden all her life, and this is the way to get out of it. And yeah. And now, one of the things you said, uh, you're older than I am, but not, uh, you're, we're closer in age than you are with your boyfriend Tyler uh, here, and you say that guys your age smell like Ben Gay and mothballs. <laughs> oh, no. supposed to say no, Robin. No, 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 no. <laughs> Been gay and mothballs, and you want no friends over 30. What is wrong with th those of us that are over 30? And what does that say to Tyler? He's got, what, 18 months? <laughs> they bore me. They bore you? The ones I've been up with. The ones you've been, just, the, you're not saying everybody that's over 30, just the mm -hmm. ones you've been with. Yeah, the ones, yeah. I, the ones I've been with. What's the oldest guy you've dated in the last five, six years? 40. 40? They usually run about 10, 15, 20 years younger than I am. Yeah. And d did you, did you wear wigs all the time? Yes. Did you shave your head so you could wear wigs all the time? Yes. Yeah, yes, I did. You say you want to just grow old gracefully. <laughs> Is that... <laughs> Did I read that right? 
I don't know. I don't have my glasses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, you said, and I quote, is your memory gone too? Or you, you, you say that at your wedding, was it your wedding that they were calling her the ice skating lady? Yeah. Why? She had a skirt on, I think, went right up to here. And it was this pink little thing that you would see on an ice skating rink. And she looked beautiful, don't get me wrong. She looks awesome. But... Maybe it just wasn't the right place to wear it. You, you said that you don't, you're not doing this to get attention. No. I'm doing it to be different. Do you drive... Did somebody tell me you drive around your car with a mask on? That's true. And you do that so you blend in? What? <laughs> <laughs> I do it for... You put a mask... What kind of mask? An old lady mask. <laughs> okay, you put on an old lady mask so you... So people... It's just fun. I'll be driving down and someone will peep at me because I have long hair wig and I'll look over at them and they'll... Okay. Okay. All right. I need a break. I don't know about the rest of you, but I need a break. We're going to come back and talk about this some more. The idea is, should Audrey take Crystal's advice? And hang up those mini skirts and pick up her cookie sheet. We'll talk about that when we come back. Audrey should be dating somebody who has at least been to their 10 year high school reunion. Tyler makes me feel sexy. Our age difference has never been a problem for either one of us. She craves attention, I think she's addicted to attention. Well, Audrey says she knows she's hot and sexy at 60. Now, Crystal says Audrey should be acting like a grandmother, going to early bird buffets and, <laughs> and baking cookies, not wearing leather and lace and dating someone that she was initially interested in. So you were initially interested in this one. I thought he was attractive. I have a beautiful husband. Okay, if, I... she was, if she was also playing the grandmother role, like, you know, being with the kids and all of that sort of thing, would you not care about this, or is, does this just seem to not fit? It doesn't fit. It just doesn't, it doesn't fit. fit. So, you're, Tyler, you're, you're dating someone here that's, what, 35, 40 years older than you? Yeah. What's your thinking on that? <clears throat> no just, thought about it, really. It, is, it just doesn't matter? No, she doesn't act her age, obviously. Um, usually, she makes me feel 70. I mean... <laughs> Okay, but now, are, are you two thinking about a long-term relationship? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. and you understand that, that right now, at 28, Tyler's aging curve is flat. I mean, he's going to be pretty much the same at 34, or 35, or 36 that he is at 28. But the difference between 62 and 72, the difference between 62 and 82, that's a huge... You're, you're aging at a much higher rate than he is. Do, do, you, do you get that? Not all the surgery in the world is going to change that. You can't do a liver lift or a... <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, you know get, your, get, your, get your gizzard fixed or whatever. I mean, you are... I mean, you realize that the, the age gap is getting wider all the time. You, you don't... You, I don't. How about you? No, I don't think so. I mean, she, she, looks, Wait a minute. she looks this way outside, and I don't know, inside she has to be as well. Her stamina... No, no, I'm not saying that that's not okay, but I'm just saying, do you understand? This is math, not magic. Right. The, the aging curve, the cellular deterioration between 62 and 82 is dramatically different than between 28 and 48. Yeah. And, and I'm just, I, what I'm, the reason I'm bringing that up is not because there's something wrong with you being older, as long as you guys get that, because I don't want you to wind up falling in love and then getting hurt because all of a sudden he's having to put you in the car. <laughs> I don't see that happening. But uh, do you understand what I'm saying? I, I just wouldn't want you to, to, to get hurt because the metrics change here in, in some way and that you, you aren't aware that there are going to be differences in the future. I don't think about it. 
I think... I know that's why I'm bringing it up. <laughs> I don't want to think about it. So, so do, do, you, do you, you get what I'm saying, I right? Oh, I, under saying. I understand what you're saying. I just am going to beat it. I don't know how. I don't I'm either. Gonna be, That's uh, what I need to I'm, I'm going to yeah. be. I'm going to beat it. I'm going to beat it. I'm, I'm not saying that your spirit can't stay young and that you can't stay young, but I'm saying that right now you may have like a 35-year difference in, in, in you, you have the ability to run and play and do some things that may change some across time. And if both of y'all have had a candid and honest conversation about that, then, you know, we, 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 more power to you. Tyler does try to talk to me about it, uh -huh. but I won't listen. Okay. <laughs> All right, next. <laughs> We're going to talk to a woman who says her husband can't stand the fact that she's so good looking after losing over 140 pounds. We'll be right back. size 24 to a size 4. I'm fat now and she's not. My husband Mike is flat out jealous. It's fun having attention. I'm not gonna lie. Now she's too hot. All right, today's guests say they hated the way they used to look, but all has changed because they're now looking hot. Now my next guest says ever since she lost 140 pounds, her husband's jealousy has gotten out of control and is jeopardizing their marriage. Take a look. All my life, I've been heavy. At my highest weight, I was 270 pounds. I have lost 140 pounds. I had gastric bypass surgery, and I went from a size 24 to a size 4. My wife has lost a ton of weight, and now she's too high. Before my surgery, we were at a bar, and there was a girl in there that had a crush on my husband. Her girlfriends were saying to her, Mike's here. And she said, yeah, but he's with his fat wife. She can kiss my ass now. I look great, and I love it. I deserve to look like this now. I'm never going to be able to eat all this. After my wife's surgery, I ended up gaining 75 pounds because she would put her food that she couldn't eat on my plate. That's not cool. I'm fat now, and she's not. What's your name? My husband, Mike, is flat out jealous. I hate it when other guys check her out. You didn't have to purposely walk by him. Why? Because you thought I was looking at them? Did you think I was doing it for them? We are not allowed to go out without each other. My wife, Bobby, has a pair of jeans that are low cut, and it shows her thong. But I don't like her wearing them outside the house. Mike does not trust me. I think it's because I've lost so much weight and I look great and people hit on me. We're out playing pool and this guy come up and slapped her on the derriere and I jumped over and went to try to kick his butt. It's fun having attention. I'm not gonna lie. I went years when nobody even noticed me where I was invisible. When other guys flirt with my wife, I'm like, hey, you see that ring? Yeah, I bought it. It's there for a reason. There's a confrontation almost every time we go out. Michael will either get into a fight with someone or he will yell at me for talking to a guy. She was dancing with her friend and I said, hey, leave her alone. It was like, it's free country, I can do what I want. Like, okay, boom. <laughs> that was free, no charge. Mike needs to get over his jealousy. We're gonna wind up divorced if he doesn't stop. I've never been insecure until now because I'm fat and she is so hot. Girls used to hit on Mike all the time. But now that the shoe's on the other foot, he doesn't like it at all. Dr. Phil, my husband thinks I'm too hot to handle. Why is he so jealous? Well, you started crying when the tape was playing and they were talking about uh, your life before. Tell me why. It's so hard being heavy. I mean, look at the difference. I mean, <laughs> people can just be cruel. So you suffered during that time. And so now you're getting even. <laughs> Not getting even, feeling comfortable with who I am. Well, I, I'm, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, but when you said those girls that used to flirt with my husband now can kiss my butt, sounds like getting even to me. <laughs> uh, there's an element of that, there's an element of it. I'm not saying it's wrong, or that you haven't earned that, or whatever, but I'm just trying to get to the bottom of this. 
What do you th do? You, do you question her fidelity? No, it's not that. It's just, you know, if a guy's gonna walk by and slap her on the butt with me standing there, what happens if she goes out by herself? And plus, she just talks about how it hurt her with her being overweight. How do you think I'm starting to feel? You know? Yeah. And it just happened so quick. One day you look in the mirror and you're like, whoa. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's not really how it happened. <laughs> Well, that's how it seemed to happen because, you know. It's like you're walking by the mirror. Ooh. Oh, no. I hate it when that happens. I, I guess the question I've got for you is are, are you at, at a point where the, the pendulum has swung the other way? And so right now it's just like really new and you're out there kind of rocking and rolling? Very true. I mean, it, are you giving him reason to wonder? kind of where your head is at, at this point? I hope not. Well, no, I, no, hope, I mean, but I think about it. Well, it's like when we used to go out and when we met, I weighed 200 pounds and girls would come up and hit on me and I'd be like, well, talk to my wife, you know? Oh, well, go tell that to my wife. No, and she goes, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. And walks away. I mean, it's, it, this is, I haven't, this isn't the first time I've seen this, okay? And it's sort of like you were in a really, Body, you were in a body image before that you weren't comfortable with. You went through a lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of the things necessary to get you where you are at this point, and now it's like, okay, all that good time I missed, I mean, it's kind of like doing an end zone dance down there. It's like, check this, buddy. Right. And so, and isn't it natural and normal that that might be a little uncomfortable for your husband? <laughs> I think it might be, especially with him gaining the weight. Right, well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Is Michael wrong for not trusting Bobby when she goes out? Now, we put her to the test. We followed her with our cameras on a night out on the town, and we're going to find out what kind of message she's sending or not sending when we come back. She was flirty. Yeah, but you're good. No one... While at the bar, her butt was pressing up against my knee. Some guys can certainly misinterpret that as a very overly flirtatious action. Before my surgery, I had no confidence whatsoever. Now I have all the confidence in the world. I think my wife, Bobby, is too H-O-T hot since she lost her weight. Okay, after being overweight and what she considered as markedly unattractive most of their lives, my guests today say now that they're hot, they just want to show it off. It's like, hey, it's my turn. Now, Bobby used to weigh 270 pounds, and she says she felt absolutely invisible. She claims that all that changed since she's lost over 140 pounds. Now her husband can't handle all the attention that she's getting. So we did a little experiment. We sent Bobby out on the town to see what kind of impression she makes with the opposite sex, what kind of message she sends. What's your name? My name's Scott. Scott, I'm Bobby. Bobby, yeah. Bobby. Yeah. No, that's my grandma's ring. You're married, huh? I am married. Yeah. Then where's my chicken? <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. The ball's coming from back here. You gotta, like, turn up. You like that? Yeah. Like. My impression of her initially was that she was single because she was flirty. Yeah, but you're good. No, I'm not. It's two bad people against one good person. Excuse me. Did you just get a manicure? One of those things the girls have to do to be painstakingly beautiful. I think she does enjoy the attention, does enjoy the flirtation, does enjoy the physical contact. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Can you give me some tips? Because I suck. Give you tips? I felt like she was just out there enjoying herself, but enjoy yourself by getting guys to notice her. So there were two things that I noticed. The first was while at the bar, her butt was pressing up against my knee, even though I tried to move it back as far as possible, it was still there, and some guys could certainly misinterpret that as a very overly flirtatious action. The second was she had found an excuse to uh, tuck to my stomach and also caress my chest. <laughs> I think she wants to be approached by men, and if she's not, I think she'll subtly approach them and, and uh, let them know that she's there. Bottom English. Doing that on purpose or what? Maybe just a little bit. Okay. But, you know, what do you think? <laughs> I'm glad I didn't go. 
So that's offensive to your sensibilities? That makes me mad, yes. Okay, now, and you, this wasn't a hidden camera. You, you knew that there was a camera there? Correct. Okay, so it wasn't like we snuck up on you or anything, so it's not like she was But out. in the places where you're at, if there are two guys sitting there and I have to walk up between them to get a drink, I'm obviously going to push against him because there's no room. So it's not like I was rubbing against him just to, check, check to do it flirtatiously. Michael, check for me. Did somebody write stupid on my forehead? <laughs> uh, I don't see it. You I don't see it. see it. Okay. Just it's, Do I have one as no, well? No, no. It's, it's, it's not. No. No. Now, c look, come on. Are you telling me that during that time this was just a geography problem? That you you couldn't you, you, if you walk up between two guys at a bar, you, there's nothing you can do about it. I don't see now, the other guy. Can I just get you to study this a little bit? What message does that send to you? I I guess I don't have anything to say because I don't consider myself flirting. Okay, but the question is, what what do other people? Consider and is your husband unreasonable about this? Because there's a definite hair flip that goes on here. Now I understand body language. I, I do this a lot. There's okay. a definite hair flip where you actually flipped your hair. At, girls, is that a is that a flirting technique or not? When you flip your hair? <laughs> now, I've never been a big hair flipper personally, but I, I think here we go. Watch this. Ah! I also never wear my hair down either, so. <laughs> oh, you got an answer for everything. I do. But the pictures don't lie. Now, but look, here's the thing. The, the, I'm not saying that, that you have bad intentions at all. What I am saying is, are you aware that the behavior, we interviewed guys there, they said, I thought she was single. She was flirting with me. And then she comes back. She has this piece of paper. And I said, well, can I look at it? You know, maybe we can go there later. And she, she was like, sure, and she puts it back in her pocket. Well, today it's laying we were, on the... We were busy. The, hold on, it's the desk on the hotel, and it's got their email address and all this on it. Okay, coming up. <laughs> I'm going to tell Michael what I think about these insecurities and where I think the dangers lie so we don't get a bunch of fist fights going on over all of this, which has happened. We'll be right back. staring at you. We fight about my husband's jealousy all the time. We fight about everything, but it always comes back to some guy flirting with me. You need to get over yourself. He constantly says, did you see that guy looking at you? Why were you talking to him? It never ends. Bobby says that she has no idea that going from a size 24 to a size 4 would cause her husband to become so jealous that it would tear their relationship apart and create tension in between. Now, what, what did you ask her during the break just now? I told her I loved her. So you're worried she's mad? Well, kinda. So what did you say when he said he loved you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> just mm-hmm? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is it that has you backed up? I feel like I'm being picked on. <laughs> okay, that's your victim story. Now talk to me about the ownership part of it. You're getting picked on, but is there any ownership you have in the situation? I guess I don't see it like that on the tape. Okay, see, that, that's the reason I said before that I wanted to specifically, affirmatively say that I am not suggesting that you're out looking to have an affair or looking to be inappropriate with some guy. But I know this, you spend a long time feeling invisible, you spend a long time feeling criticized, you spend a long time with people being mean and cruel and insensitive to you because your body image was not what you wanted it to be, and now you've lost all of this weight, gotten in shape, looking good, feeling good, and it is great to celebrate that. But you have to be really careful about the message you send, because I can tell you from a guy's point of view, they might be receiving a different message than you're intending. You're just like, hey, I'm feeling good, having fun, rock and roll, and they're saying, target, <laughs> and if you... And, and if you're putting out a message that says, come on, then you might be getting in a situation you don't want. And that's how you feel, right? You don't think she's out no, no. catting I know, around, do you? I know my wife loves me and all that. And it's, 
never been a problem with her. I've never really, really got mad at her. It's guys that just won't stop. And so you hit them. Well, well no. As for the being smacked no, on no. the butt and that kind of thing, that the bar, very, though, when we go rude. out, I stand next to him. So everybody knows, especially at the bars that we go to, that we are married. But he's a pretty good sized old boy, and if somebody's yeah. snapping you and on the butt. Had a stick. <laughs> yeah, but a pretty I good size stick. old boy with a stick, and I somebody have a stick. still. <laughs> I can defend myself. Right. Just from looking at it, if you think the behavior looked flirtatious, then clap. Okay. If you think the behavior didn't look flirtatious, just I'm just having a good time. Clap. Thank you. Okay, she's the one with a grandmother. <laughs> See, she has a different yardstick. <laughs> she has a 62-year-old grandmother standing through the sunroof of the car going down the strip, okay? So you got to put that one over to the side. Okay. There were a couple more. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And you slide the spaghetti, just keep sliding it on. Get I in know, shape. You don't want to be out of shape. No, sir. You won't like your body image. You won't like yourself. You're feeling insecure, and it's bad for your health. He wants to take your fitness challenge. You, we, we can certainly get you in shape, and you're going to need to be in shape if you keep swinging on everybody that right. looks at her. You, you, you need to deal with that now, and then you all will be the beautiful people. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> yes. I may look like that when we go out, but that's not how I feel. I still feel like I'm big, like I'm large and heavy. Why? How well, is that going to change? How that, actually, we're going to talk about that next. Okay, I want you to listen to the next guest I'm talking to. We're going to talk about that very specific thing. Next, we're going to talk to the winner of The Swan, a popular makeover show. She says that now she's hot on the outside, but still feeling the same way on the inside that she did before. So we're going to talk about that very thing. We'll be right back. Being on this one held a mirror up to me about the person that I was and the person that I wanted to be and how very different those two people were. If the only thing that you can say about me is that I'm pretty or I'm hot, really don't say anything else. We've been talking to women who say they've gone from plain Jane to just downright sexy. Now, Delisa was the winner of the popular reality makeover show, The Swan. Now, although she says that she got tired of feeling like the ugly duckling, she had no idea how painful and confusing looking sexy would be. I'm a captain in the Army Reserve. I would describe myself as a plain Jane. I looked masculine and I acted tough, but I just felt very insecure underneath it. The Swan is my first real success in life. It was really an amazing feeling to win. I like what I see when I look in the mirror now. I had a brow lift, a mid face lift. I had some fat added to my cheek folds here, some lipo here, and I had a breast augmentation and a tummy tuck. Delise is one of my closest friends. She's gone from an average woman to a very attractive person with the same issues. Don't judge me based on how I look. Don't give me credit for that. I didn't earn it. You know, I earned my degree. I earned being a captain in the military. A lot of these guys that are approaching me in bars never would have given me a second look before. What do you do? The guys that are hitting on me. I'm a little scared now. They do go into <laughs> mode. Oh, you do not just say that. If the only thing that you can say about me is that I'm pretty or I'm hot, really don't say anything at all. Before this one, she was very outgoing but not overly confident. After the show, she relied less on her cleverness and her friendliness to her outward appearance. I can sometimes be given preferential treatment that I don't deserve. I called a plumber out and he says, oh, well, you know, I won't charge you for this or I'll do that for you. I'm not supposed to, but I will. You wonder, would he have done that before? I don't want her to be caught up in the superficiality of all that she's experienced. Being on this one held a mirror up to me about the person that I was and the person that I wanted to be and how very different those two people were. Dr. Phil, even though I look hot to everyone on the outside, I still struggle with a lack of confidence on the inside. You feel like you've cheated the system, don't you? <laughs> a little bit. Because you said, I earned my degree, I earned my rank, I earned all of these things, and then 
I just kind of was given this. I didn't earn it. I, I, I cheated the system. I had a lot of people who helped me to achieve what I did, and I didn't feel like I necessarily earned it as I did those other things in my life. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I don't like being given credit for what I didn't earn. You know her really well. What do you see differently in her now than you saw before this transformation? Well, I, I see that she probably has bought into some of the attention a little bit and um, is not real certain about her identity. I think that's the biggest concern that I've seen, that she <clears throat> may not really know herself still, even though she's gone through a lot of changes. But you were that way before, right? I mean, this you didn't particularly like the skin you were in on the left. Right. You were uncomfortable there. Yes. You don't like the skin you're in on the right. You're uncomfortable there. So the common denominator is not really being in touch with who you are, right? Yeah, I think that's true. Because I know people sometimes criticize shows like The Swan. And when you make that kind of transformation, the whole idea is you've got to do it from the inside out. Right. What you want is that the rapper just reflects the way you feel on the inside. And that's not what's happened. We did have a lot of support. We actually went mm -hmm. through therapy and sure. had life coaching and, and a curriculum during the SWAN program, but it's four months of being completely <clears throat> isolated. You think you're making all these great gains, and then you go back out into the real world, and people are very harsh and very critical, <clears throat> and um, really not very many positive things to say about the way I went about using the resources that were, were presented to me. But you resent the fact that men pay attention to you now that didn't pay attention to you before, and you're the same person now you were then, and so you resent the fact that they're that superficial. I do. It's like, you didn't like me before, so don't come buddy up to me now. It's offensive. It's degrading. Okay, and, and so they're like, what? <laughs> what? I was just being nice. <laughs> but yet you do go out there, and, and you do dress to your body. You do things that, that draw attention, and then when they do, yeah then, <laughs> yeah, then it's like you put up a big stop sign. But look, here's the deal. I, I want to tell you something that I really hope you'll hear, think about, and listen to. And it's the same thing that I hope, Bobby, that, that you'll hear, think about, listen to. There's nothing wrong with what you've done. You made that decision. Um, I don't know if you'd make it again. Body image and self-image are interlinked. They should not be. It's wrong. It's not healthy. People that are overweight feel worse about themselves, and they, they think that they're not as good a people. They are critical of themselves. That's wrong. People, can, you can be just as loving and caring and giving and intelligent and contributing in your life, whether you are attractive or not attractive. It, it, it makes no difference. But what does have to happen with you now, and needed to happen with you before, is you have to clearly decide what your authentic self is. Because everybody has that unique configuration of traits, skills, abilities, characteristics. Some are God-given, some are learned across time that uniquely define who you are. And if you haven't met yourself enough to identify who and what that is and then accept and embrace who and what that is, you'll never be happy in this skin, the other skin, or any other skin. It will never matter unless and until you truly know who you are and accept that. And that's never really happened with you. True? True. Now, think about this. You went and spent four months sequestered in a surgical boot camp <laughs> that, that redid you and, and remade you with, with top quality physicians, top quality care, but you've never done that kind of intensive work to determine who you really are on the inside, what if you decided it's time for me to meet me? It's time for me to find out what I am truly all about. And you did that and discovered that and embraced that, and so you had that and this. That would you, be ideal. You, you had the, you, at, at that point, you could say, I now look on the outside the way I feel on the inside. It, it doesn't matter what the rapper is. There's a lot of really good looking people in Hollywood that I, I just wouldn't swerve the car for. <laughs> I just, I mean, um, <laughs> seriously. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying. 
And I don't mean that literally, but I mean, you, it doesn't matter how much you can dress up and doll up. It's who you are inside. And all I'm asking is that you invest the same time in doing that that you spend in doing that. Does that mean you need to go in some inpatient program for four months to meet yourself? Of course not. But you do need to put it on project status and decide, you know what, I, I really need to get comfortable and realize that you know, if some guy's coming up and he's drawn to me because I have stereotypic, attractive qualities, traits, and characteristics, then I can't blame him for that. But give him a chance to get to know you before you karate chop him or something <laughs> just because they had the audacity to think you were attractive. Then determine whether they have more depth than that, and then both of you can. But you've got to decide who you are. I mean, and really, I'll give you some things to do that will lead you specifically to that point. It's been so much more difficult because I've had to do it in the public eye and with so much public opinion about what I've done and how I've done it. And so finding myself since the show has been interrupted by other people's, you know, putting their perception on me and projecting that. Um, and, and that is a problem with some of those shows is that being in the public eye and in t on television all is not for civilians. And so <laughs> we'll be right back. I really appreciate everybody coming in and talking about these things today because people get in this situation. When you make changes, it really can present new challenges for you. And uh, what I'm going to do is give you two a copy of Self Matters and the Self Matters workbook. And I'm going to tell you the specific things that I think you need to do. You say you got off track when it got on the physical. and you, but I'm going to show you how to get back because you I mean you can have both you can feel really great about yourself and look great about yourself and not be crossways with your partner or the people in your life either All right, for exercises on getting to know yourself go to drphil.com because I'm going to put some of the things that I'm going to lead these guys to do that are in more detail in self matters thanks for watching we'll see you soon Sandra of the Dr. Phil family is missing. It's your dad. You're beginning to really worry me. I haven't seen her in two months. Well, she's really wrapped up in drugs. She was on enough medications that would put both of us to sleep. You know, something awful could happen to her. Now, she returns to face Dr. Phil. My life isn't crappy because I take pain medication. You've always said, I have to do these pain medications because I have pain. There's not something there that would cause an ongoing pain problem. I think that each doctor has their own opinion. And you know that's totally not credible, right? What will it take? She needs detoxification. Do you want to do that? No. To save her life. So you don't want to get better. I have my own doctor. The truth is, you want the drugs. I didn't come here to talk about pain pills. Why are you here? I don't want to come to your funeral. This is going to be a changing day in your life. Not a good show, everybody. Here we go. It matters to you. That's what I want to talk about. Are we ready to move? Let's do it. Today, I'm continuing with Alexandra of the Dr. Phil Family Series. It was nine years ago when she accidentally got pregnant at age 14. Alexandra is now 23 years old. She has three children by three different fathers. And all of them are being raised by her parents, Aaron and Marty. Now, her family and I are now extremely concerned for her health and safety. We're also incredibly frustrated by her behavior. Now, if you're new to the Alexandra story, here's what you'll need to know for today. I went to a pain clinic because I was having problems with my back, and I guess I was taking prescriptions, and everybody thought that I was some sort of drug addict because I sought help for my back. But... 
I'm not. <laughs> You're going to lose your children. No, I'm not. Nathan's father is going to come after him. Layla's father is going to come after her. They're coming after you. They're coming after your kid. I've been, you know, at the bottom. I've been, you know, I've been where all you care about is, you know, going out and party with your friends and, you know, where you're going to get, you know, you're messed up next. And I've been there and I know how hard it is. Tony and I found out that we're having a baby. You don't have enough money, you don't have enough stability to handle two children. You're going to now divide what little money there is by three. Oh, there he is! It's a boy! Are they going to test it for drugs? She really does have to Do I need to call security? Now, Aaron's worst fears came true just days after Alex gave birth. The baby was moved to a level one pediatric care hospital because he was sadly born addicted to drugs. I have all three grandchildren with me. We have a seven-year-old, an almost three-year-old, and a five-month-old baby. What I want for Alexandra more than anything else is for her to get healthy, get her thinking straight, so that she can be the mom that I know she can be. I can't talk to her about what's going on because she's just so judgmental. It's like I don't have anybody to talk to. Did you fail a drug test? Yeah, my drug test came up positive for methadone, not methamphetamines. My mom's so ignorant, she heard meth and thought I was smoking meth. What's a boat? What's a what? Yeah, when you smoke a boat, you know, with the tin foil and the lighter, are you smoking PCP, meth, oh heroin? What have you been doing for money? I mean, the other day at the gas station, I sat there with a sign that said I'm trying to get home, have no gas. This is panhandling. What is it that I don't know that could possibly be worse than you being a drug addict? You're a prostitute? You hit the nail right on the head. Well, you want to go to Layla's first recital? No. It breaks my heart knowing that Alex isn't at Layla's first recital. You think you're addicted to oxycodone? Look, can I answer that? Alexander's got a broke back. That's painful. Yeah. There's a difference between taking your medicine and doing medicine. This is for to help me sleep, and then this is for pain. They gave you two bottles of that? Yeah. Maybe you should understand that I was in an accident, and I have pain every day, and which you are... have no idea how to yeah, deal I with. Do. No, you know I have I have early onset rheumatoid arthritis. I have degenerative disc disease. I have a back have so that... screwed up that I have to feel pain every day. Do you not remember that I've broken my back twice? Of course, Mom. It's always about you. No, You're it's always not about me. Point. I do know what it feels like to have a bad back, Alexandra. I do. And you can deal with it with other things besides medication. I do think you're addicted to prescription medication. I think you are at high risk for a super bad outcome. Don't you say, I need rehab. Yeah, well, that's not gonna happen, so you can stop. We wanted to see just how bad Alex's back problems really were. Because every time somebody brings up her dependency on medication, she has this excuse and she has used it for years. Now, she doesn't like to be called an addict. She wants to refer to her problem as a dependency rather than an addiction. I think it's semantics. I think she's playing word games. If I set you up with one of the top specialists to evaluate your spine and figure out what's going on, will you embrace that? Will you do that? I want to tell you, I have burned up huge favors to get you into this spine specialist on Monday. I have your promise you'll be there. Yes, I want to go. But also, I'm supposed to sign up for school Monday because my classes start Monday. Uh -huh. And I really, that's really important to me too. We met with Alexandra and she was on enough medications that would put both of us to sleep right now. My gut feeling tells me that I think what we should do is have her go through inpatient detox. I believe you are addicted. I believe you need to go into detox and rehab. What Dr. Berkeley and I talked about, well, the way he described it and the way you describe it are two totally different things. So the way that he describes it, I completely agree with. The way you describe it, I don't really. What are the differences? The way you're describing it, it makes me seem like um, I'm drug I go out and search for illegal drugs and um, I am abusing more than I'm supposed to be taking. And I don't need everybody every time I, I go somewhere to be like, 
It gets a little old. In one of my recent sit-downs with Alex, I looked her straight in the eye and said, in my opinion, you are an addict. No other way to say it. Well, she didn't like that, so she went MIA for a while. That is, until she got desperate and called one of my producers. I am able to get gift cards approved. I am not able to get a lot of cash. That really is I don't want to have to call and ask for a gift card. That's I am not a crackhead, and that's how you're treating me. I'm a freaking person, and you don't see that. So then she calls and says, I need cash because I owe money to some not very nice people. I'm in trouble if I don't pay them. To which we said, we're not going to give you money to pay a drug dealer. Dr. Phil, in my gut feeling, I think Alexandra has stooped to some really, really low levels with Tony as far as what's going on in that hotel room in her desperation to get money to get drugs. My fear is that she could die before we can get to her. Communication with Alex came to a complete halt and her family started getting very concerned. Hi, babe, it's your dad. I've been trying to call you all afternoon, see how you are. You're beginning to really worry me. I love you. Call me. Alexandra is missing. I haven't seen her in two months. I want to know what's going on with my daughter. I'm really worried. Last night, Alexandra called me and asked for cash. I told her, I said, we are not going to be able to give you cash. I mean, her voice sounded very small and scared, but she pretty much hung up on me when I said we couldn't give her cash. What I'm going to give Alexandra is my love and my hope, but we are not going to sit there and give her gas money, drug money. Even now, I don't know that we'd even give her food. I, I, I want her to get to a point where it's so low that she's ready to get help. Marty and I are very aware that Bottom could be death. I mean, I don't mean to sound callous, but we have to be aware of that, that that could be what happens. I miss Alexandra a lot, and I know that Marty does too. We have some family pictures up on the wall in a hallway. I look at Alexandra, and I, I'm always going to see her as that 10-year-old little girl. She was funny and smart. Oh, my gosh. And she just would try anything to go get her. And Marty and I really miss that about her. It's hard for us to think of our daughter in terms of where she is right now. So we do want to remember the positive things about her because we know that great little girl is still in there somewhere. She's still in there. I know it. She's just clouded with the drugs. Here, Erin tries to trace some of her daughter's steps. Now, she starts with a trip to Alex's pain doctor. What we're going to do today is actually head down to the doctor's office where Alexandra got her medication. I'm actually taking with me my x-rays to prove that I do have some back pain. I have actually broken my back twice. I do not think that I should be prescribed Oxycontin, Oxycodone, or anything for my pain. I just went into the doctor's office that Alexandra has been going to see. I'm completely appalled. It was just disgusting. The smell of the place, it's just a very sleazy place. There's a big sign that says no insurance, cash only, and there are a lot of people going in and out of this place. And everybody's offering tips to each other on how to get what you need from this doctor. So I go in there. The doctor does not really spend more than 10 minutes with me. The actual physical examination took less than three minutes himself. Now I have actually been to chiropractors and doctors that have tried to manage the problems with my back and they really take their time. This doctor was a poke here, here, and here, and we were done. After my physical examination, the doctor pretty much asked me what I wanted. I wrote down that I wanted oxycodone and a muscle relaxer. And then he said, well, what muscle relaxer do you want to have? I, I didn't know. I thought, well, do we have a menu? He did. He started whipping off all these names of things, and I thought, this is crazy. I mean, I can just pick. Isn't he the doctor and he's supposed to tell me what I should have? The next interesting thing 
is that he doesn't write a prescription for me to take to a pharmacy. Oh, no. You sit down and wait in the waiting room, and then they'll bring you the prescriptions. He did give me a prescription for 40 milligram tablets of oxycodone, and it was to start off slowly by not taking more than five a day. My gosh, if the doctor is starting me off slowly with 150 40 milligram tablets, what happens once you're ramped up? I am angry and appalled at how how easy it is for my daughter to walk into this place and be handed drugs that she does not need at all. Whatever she wants, she can get. Coming up, Alex comes face to face with Dr. Phil's consulting physicians and hears what they really think about her pill use. What does she need to do to get well? She needs detoxification. So what do you say about what they're saying? Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. My fiancé stood me up on my wedding day. A bride betrayed. You had no idea he wasn't showing. That morning he said, I'll see you later today, and that was the last I heard of him. Now, after two years... We tracked him down. The runaway groom returns. Danny has said that he wants to hear an apology from you. <laughs> <laughs> then on Monday... I see no redeeming qualities in this child. The most outrageous comments ever from a stepdad. Why are you allowing this man to treat your daughter in this way? Then on Tuesday. Being a mistress works for me. I'm not concerned about his wife. I didn't care who would approve or disapprove. They're just there for the taking. I do not think what I'm doing is wrong. Think you know the other woman? We'll think again. Tuesday. We now return to the Dr. Phil family, Alexandra in denial. After weeks of Alexandra missing, I mean, just off the radar, we found her living with Tony in one of his family members' rental properties. Now, her family and I believe she is seriously addicted to prescription pain pills, which she vehemently denies. Alex didn't like the way I was putting it versus what the medical doctors has had to say. We'll see if she likes their advice any better when she's face to face with them. I sat down with Alex to question her choices. So when you were last here, we had you see these top specialists to evaluate your back. They gave you some feedback at the time. I, I gave you some as well. And then you were racing back to deal with school. So how's school going? Um, it's been difficult because like I guess my, tr my truck the tag on it expired. I don't have a dri um, driver's license, so getting around has been difficult for me. So I, I'm trying to get into school. You haven't started no, yet. No, I haven't started yet, but the classes start soon, and I'm trying to get a way to get myself back and forth. How are the kids? They're good. They're good. How often do you see them? I can't talk about that. Why can't you talk about Because that's in relation to my uh, open case, and uh, there's a gag order in place. But not about the two older. It doesn't matter. Well, I'm certainly under no restrictions, and from what we understand, you went 68 days without ever seeing one of the three. Is that true? I can't answer that. There is a visitation facility for you to see them so you don't have to deal with your mother, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's factual. That's not a matter of specific to the case, and that's like 1,500 feet from where you were staying. Mm -hmm. I assume there's no reason you don't want to see your kids. Mm -hmm. you, you do want to see your kids. Absolutely. Let me take a little time out here because I want to explain why I chose not to drill down on Alex's evasive and non-responsive answers regarding her children. First, I do want to make sure that she hears what the doctors have to say about her reported back pain and her need for drugs. But make no mistake... I do get back to talking about her negligence as a mother just a little bit later on. In the meantime, keep watching. Well, let's talk about your back. How are you doing as far as pain and that sort of thing? That's managing. I'm managing it. I want you to be healthy. And so I asked Dr. Johnson and Dr. Berkeley to join us and give you some feedback, answer any questions that you have. Okay. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, thank you so much. You. Dr. Thank Johnson, you. thank you so much for being here. You bet. Good to see you. Um, just to kind of frame everything up, 
I've known Alexandra for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, since she was 15. Uh, she did have this back problem, and in one of her prior visits, uh, you know, I had called and asked for you guys to evaluate her, and you had every confidence in them when you saw them, right? Absolutely. Do you have any questions for them to, to start with? Do you have any questions for them about what's going on or, or how you're doing or what you can do? Actually, how did my MRI come out? I know that you guys um, sent me to have an MRI, and I didn't hear the results. We... Um looked at the initial MRI scan, the follow-up, really there was no significant change where you'd had an old fracture from a car accident and, uh, you know, significant injury at the time. You know, there's, there's not something there that would cause an ongoing pain problem, and, but it certainly would in the beginning. And there's not something there that we can see that needs some further intervention. Now, the accident was two years ago, mm -hmm. and these things would normally heal up across what period of time? A broken bone takes six, eight weeks for a broken bone to heal. But at, at two years, you would fully expect it to be resolved? Yes, we would. Okay. Absolutely. Alex reports having pain, and so you are taking prescription, not street drugs, but prescription drugs mm -hmm. to, to handle this, right? Mm -hmm. And you know what, we've been over what the drugs are, right? Yes, and, and the problem is, is that these medications, the narcotic pain medications or opioid medications, are really intended for short-term use. You know, at the most three to six months. It's not intended for long-term maintenance use. There should be really no reason for taking that high doses of pain medication that Alexander has been taking after this long of a period. You said that these medications can actually exacerbate the pain. It can make this worse across time. How is that and what do you mean by that? Yes, it's true. There are actually a number of ways in with which pain medications uh, actually can bring on more pain. Uh, there are uh, some theories regarding the brain, what is called glial cell activation, where actually the brain cells are actually turned on, so to speak, and produce more pain. Um, there are certain other chemicals in the brain that are affected as well from these medications. Uh, the pain receptors become uh, desensitized so that your, basically your threshold for pain drops to the basement. So the slightest ache or pain that you have may be magnified and you interpret it as a horrible, significant discomfort where, in, in fact, it might just be a simple ache that we all experience from day to day. But for you, you interpret it much differently. So at this point, Dr. Johnson, you don't think she needs additional surgery? You, uh, there, there's not anything at this point that you think needs to be done to fix her back? From the interventional standpoint, no, I, I don't think that there's something a surgeon needs to do or an interventional pain specialist needs to do. It's really a management of medications. Do you want to get well? Absolutely. I mean, what does she need to do to get well? Uh, as Dr. Johnson and I were speaking earlier, uh, she needs detoxification, uh, inpatient where she can be monitored. And it's not just a matter of detox and getting off of the pain medication. I, I really think that Alexandra has a lot of potential in life, and I think that not just getting off the medication, but also having a comprehensive therapy to help complement the detox and get her back onto a life where she's not dependent on these medications to live her life would be the best thing for her. But she also doesn't want to live with pain. I, I really truly believe that her pain would either go away or become minimal to the point where she can manage it with over-the-counter anti-inflammatories at the most if she were to get off of her pain medication. So what do you say about what they're saying? I really don't have anything to say. Well, what, what do you mean? We're just having a discussion. I don't know. I'm, I'm listening and I'm taking in their, their information and I'm processing it, but I don't have a response to that. <laughs> they're saying there is a road to health for you. There is a road that will get you out of your pain, off of the medications, and functioning at, at a much higher level in terms of your efficiency and the quality uh, of your life by eliminating pain and dependency on drugs. They, they have a treatment course for you. Do you want to do that? Coming up. My life, I mean, isn't crappy because I take pain medication. It's not. 
We're not talking about the next three to six months. We're talking about the next 10 to 15 to 20 years of your life. My doctor makes me get a blood test every three months. It's beyond a blood test, though. We now return to the Dr. Phil family, Alexandra in denial. Since the last time I was on the Dr. Phil show, Tony and I moved into his mom's rental property. Tony is working, he's doing roofing, and I'm kind of doing the housewife thing. I've come a long way medication-wise, and what I'm prescribed now is enough for me to get through the day. I can sleep at night, and it helps, and that's the whole point of the medication, is to manage my pain and make sure that, make it so where I have a semi-normal life. They're saying there is a road to health for you by eliminating pain and dependency on drugs. They have a treatment course for you. Do you want to do that? No. So you don't want to get better? I'll get better. My, this is, oh, never mind. No, go ahead. No, that, that's okay. Well, just, and look, I'm not arguing with you. And look, you're an adult. You can do whatever you want to do. I'm just asking you. You talk about my quality of life and, and all this and that. Just because I, I have to take something for, I still believe it's pain. And my doctor, you know, still thinks I have pain. And whether, you know. Your doctor at the pain clinic down there? Yeah. We are going to Orlando to my doctor's appointment. I am telling you. This is not good, because you're going to get me in trouble with the camera being here. Why? Because this is a pain management office. People are sensitive about it. This is for to help me sleep. I got ibuprofen. And then this is for pain. All right, and there was one more, wasn't there? Yeah, it's the same bottle. It's the same thing. They gave you two bottles of that? Yeah, because one has count and then the rest has another count your point is you think they're wrong no i don't think they're wrong but i think that you know I, never mind <laughs> well uh, not never mind i mean what uh, i've brought you the best of the best and they're saying good news you're, you're, you're taking drugs that are very likely making your pain worse, not better. And that with a, with a treatment course, beginning with detoxification, it's very likely you can be pain-free and drug-free. Mm. Um, and that doesn't interest you? Like I said, I, I'm not jumping in anything. I need to process information and, and think about it. But because my life, I mean, isn't... <clears throat> excuse me, isn't crappy because I take pain medication. It's not. I still go out to the beach. I still have a good time. I, I don't live in, in, a, in a hotel prostituting myself out for my prescription drugs. I mean, you, you talk about my quality of life, but my quality of life is just as good as if it if a wasn't prescribed pain medication. The problem is a healthy female of your age shouldn't be on this dosage of narcotics for this long. And, and that's the problem. We're not talking about the next three to six months. We're talking about the next 10 to 15 to 20 years of your life at the minimum and what's going to happen. There's a lot of issues that go on with these medications. And if they're not properly monitored and not taken for the right reasons, they can produce significant problems. My doctor makes me get a blood test every three months. It's beyond a blood test, though. There's just more to I it. understand, and we, we've talked about, my doctor and I, we, we talk about things. It's not like he's just some quack with a medical license. He's not. Coming up. I am bringing you a way out of this. And if you say, not interested, don't want to do that, then that speaks volumes to me. Two questions I have. What's the end point and why are you here? We now return to the Dr. Phil family, Alexandra in denial. You have called us before and said that you are in the floor, you are cold, you are shaking, it's like the flu ten times over. I don't recall that, but okay. When you were with Chris and you were talking to Beth. I don't, I don't think that's what I said, but okay. Maybe you don't remember because it sounded like 
withdrawal at that mm. point. Okay. I mean, Alex is here, and she's been sitting here sick all day, being from her kidney stones and, you know, being dope sick, you know, and she's you know, not feeling good, and she's been laid up in bed all day, you know. I've asked Alex about the rehab thing I'm going to again. Alex keeps telling me she's not ready for rehab. But I don't think anybody's ever ready for rehab. I'm going to do everything I can to try to get her in that rehab. I'll go with her. You know, I'll, I want the best for Alex. That's the mother of my only child, you know? Maybe this is, this is good for me to be clear because you don't like the term addict or addicted. You, you prefer the term dependent, which I'll totally respect that. We could call it kumquats if you want to. I don't care what semantics we use. But you have said that you're doing what you're doing because you need it. These guys, trust me, they don't... I don't doubt them They at don't all. bend what they're saying because Dr. Phil has an agenda here, which you think I do, and you're quite right. I do have an agenda here. And it's for you to be healthy and happy and back with your kids and your life going well. And you've always said, I have no choice. I have to do these pain medications because I have pain. These are guys that are saying, actually, that's probably right. You had acute pain at the time and you started medicating it. And he's saying it's probably actually making it worse now. I am bringing you a way out of this. And if you say, not interested, D don't want to do that, then that speaks volumes to me. Because they're telling you not only is it not helping, it's probably hurting. And that's their opinion and they're entitled to it. But like I said, I have my own doctor at home. <laughs> so, and that's fine. And I appreciate all the help that they've offered me and they've given me, you know, and taken the time out of their day to, to help me out. I appreciate it. But I'm not going to jump at some somebody's offer just because they put it on the table. So you drive five hours to see this doctor? And I'll drive five hours. I drive an hour and a half, yes. Each way? Yeah. Okay, so you drive three hours. That's fine. So if you get in a crisis, he's there for you? Yes, he is. So if Dr. Johnson and Dr. Berkeley talk to your doctor in Florida and they collaborated on this case and came to the same opinion, what would your, what would your attitude be then? My doctor's not interested in coming on your show. He's already told me uh, that. Oh, I'm not sorry. interested in coming on the show. And he I'm, doesn't, I'm no offense, I'm but not I'm absolutely not certain that he doesn't want to come on this show. No, I'm not asking if they want to talk to him on the show. I'm asking if they would do a professional consult with your doctor But that privately. still has to deal with you. No, it doesn't have to do does. with me. It does, it does. Because they're... do with me. Dr. Phil, they're These aware. two are independent practitioners. Okay. Professionals consult with one another. Okay. And I've got a sneaking suspicion that if he consulted with these gentlemen, that he would have a different opinion. Okay. And I think that's why you don't want him to talk to them. He doesn't want to talk to them. Does that strike y'all as odd that, that there's a that there's a physician out there that wouldn't consult with an evaluating physician to, to get information and input? I find it unusual. I mean, I can pick up the phone and talk to anybody in the country usually and say, we're taking care of your patient. What, what's your input? What's the background? I mean, let, let's share it because we have a common goal. It's trying to make somebody better. Right. We're happy to. Happy to communicate anywhere, anytime. Privately, away from cameras, not on the show, not anything to do with us, just a private consultation with him. That's the way it's usually done. Well, certainly. But you're saying he wouldn't take that call? No. I got, a, I got two questions. What's the end point? Where, where do you envision yourself? And why are you here? Coming up. So you just don't think they know what they're talking about? I think that each doctor has their own opinion. And you know that's totally not credible, right? I mean, nobody believes it. And the truth is, you want the drugs. We now return to the Dr. Phil family. Alexandra in denial. I got two questions. What's the end point? Where, where do you envision yourself? And why are you here? I didn't come here to talk about my, you know, my amount of pain pills that I use. I really didn't. I came here to ask for help so I can get in school, so I can make my life better for my children. You I think your goal is very admirable that you want to do all that, but I think that one of the major steps you have to take for that really is to get off of these medications. Because we know that 
the longer you take these medications, they won't have the same effect on you. You're going to need higher and higher and higher doses. And that's where we say, where is this end? Where is this going to end? And that's where our concern is. Do you think they have an agenda of, of wanting to do something that doesn't help you? Do you think they want to hurt you, sabotage you in any way? No, I'm sure they don't. So you just don't think they know what they're talking about? I think that each doctor has their own opinion. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's the greatness of this whole medical world, that each doctor, it's why you go to one doctor, you get a second opinion, you go get a third opinion, that each doctor has a different opinion. Mm -hmm. And you know that's totally non-credible, right? I mean, it's really the only thing you can say right now because you, you, you have no intention of, of changing what you're doing. So the only thing you can do is, is take that position. I understand that. It is okay. it's completely non-credible. And nobody believes it. You don't believe it. You're saying that every doctor has their opinion. They're entitled to yours. But you have a doctor down there that instead thinks you need to be on these medications and so he's the one you're going to believe because uh, he's a better doctor and that's a better opinion. I didn't opinion. say that. And the truth is you're believing him because he's telling you what you want to hear because okay. you want the drugs. Okay. And he's giving you the drugs. Okay. A anything else you all have to add because I don't want to waste your, any more of y'all's time. You know, when you talk about additional opinions, now there are probably some addiction specialists. I mean, you know, and people who are really engaged in the detox world. I mean, maybe, have you seen anybody like that, Alexander? Have you really been to a detox program yes, or somebody who specializes? Yes, I've spoken to somebody who specializes in detox. Who, who is that? They work at the health department in my, uh, in my county. Do they think your meds were appropriate? Yeah, actually. My first substance yeah. abuse go around. That's interesting to me because sure. I, I think it's absolutely ludicrous and I don't believe that anybody with a full history of what's going on would believe that. Okay. I don't believe it. I don't think they believe it. I don't think you believe it. And you can say what you want to say, but at least you're not going to go home saying I pulled the wool over his eyes because I know better. Okay. And you know I know better. Okay. So. I'd also like to say too, Alexandra, you have a choice and an option here. We can only just show you the way. If you make a decision not to do that, it's, it's going to be a problem for you later in life. So the choice is yours. We've got lots of resources. No, we've... We've offered her every possible help and assistance, and she doesn't want it. It is what it is, and the costs have been very high to Alexander in her life, but she's not ready to make that change. So, all right. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Dr. Burke, Phil. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for all you do. Alexander, sure. we wish you well. Thank Absolutely. You. Our door is always open. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Good luck to you. <laughs> Alexandra seems to be in denial. She seemed to put all of her faith in this other doctor's opinion that the pain medication at these high doses are required. I don't know him, but based on what we're seeing from her case and what we know of the facts, it doesn't appear that uh, her medication is being properly dosed. I am concerned about her well-being in the long term. I mean, this is not something that uh, gets better with time. Drug addiction gets worse. Dependency gets worse. I'm afraid what will happen to Alex is that eventually at some point she's going to require higher and higher doses of the medications. She will potentially end up hurting herself or somebody else and eventually uh, she's going to look back at this as, a, as the moment in her life she could have made a change. I don't have a crystal ball, but I only see bad if she keeps going the way she's going. Coming up... Alexandra is allowing drug dealers to use her truck. Now, I know what I'm talking about this time. It was in the newspaper, big word, methamphetamine. We now return to the Dr. Phil family. Alexandra in denial. Aaron and Marty recently learned that Alexandra's dealings with drugs may be more serious than they had even originally thought. We're about to see Aaron explain that Alex may be friends with suspected drug dealers. Then Marty, who is also looking for answers, tails his daughter's truck one night when a stranger takes off in her vehicle. Alexandra is allowing drug dealers to use her truck. I was shocked. I mean, I have a picture of 
her truck directly in front of what we call the meth house, which was recently busted. Seven people were in the house. Five were put into jail for selling and manufacturing methamphetamine. Now, I know what I'm talking about this time. It was in the newspaper, big word, methamphetamine, not methadone. A meth lab bust in St. Augustine ends with the arrest of five people after receiving multiple complaints of possible drug activity. Investigators say once they searched the house, they found marijuana, drug paraphernalia, and a large amount of prescription pills. Seven people were inside at the time of the search. Five of those were arrested. Right now, we are following my daughter's truck. Looked like some dirt bag was actually driving it. It upsets me like you wouldn't believe. These creeps driving with my daughter's car just send me into like this really rage because they're just scumbags of the earth. We've been driving around St. Augustine following my daughter's derelict friends that are driving her truck. I said, just drive by Alexandra's house. At least I would get some kind of comfort being fairly close to her. And it was so weird. I saw the thing on the couch. Obviously, the front door was open. Alexandra was standing in the front door. I'm really to the point where something really needs to be done as far as, you know, the whole truck thing, the, the meth house being busted with, with her truck sitting there. And it's just, everything just adds up to where, you know, she's really wrapped up in drugs and we really need to uh, get something done. Or, I hate to say this, you know, something awful could happen to her. I am so angry, I can't see straight. I told you I hated you, and I do hate you. Dr. Phil, I know I'm failing. It can't continue the way that it is. Your daughter drank bleach from a sippy cup. She's had lice. She's had a book bag with maggots and mold. I'm being the best mom that I can be. Living with Tori is like living with the Antichrist. I see absolutely no redeeming qualities in this child. None. Why are you allowing this man to treat your daughter in this way? I don't care what the audience thinks. I don't see that this baby gets any discipline. The baby is wild. The baby is 16 months. Gina is so determined to make her 16-year-old daughter a model that she has her doing chores in high heels. This is her dream, but I'm motivating her. You can't be serious. You bullied your cousin with Down syndrome and kicked her in the back? She is disgusting. Have you seen her? Plus, go inside the mind of a mistress. This is the place that my married boyfriend pays for. So are you selling him something? I'm not selling him anything. Well, then what are you getting paid for? And for the first time ever on Dr. Phil. The triple intervention on three brothers. I understand that all you want to do is get out of this situation. But we're here to help. I accept it. Oh, there's nothing left to hold on to. Stand strong. I don't want you in my life anymore. Doesn't the legacy of anger have to stop? This world will let you down. Now in talking to you, I realize I need to be a hero for my daughter. This is going to be a changing day in your life. All this May on Dr. Phil. Today, when Alexander refused to listen to Dr. Johnson and Dr. Berkeley, and they are the best at what they do, I was clearly disappointed. Next time, you'll see how Alexander responds to accusations that she may know some of the people arrested in a local drug bust. You'll have to judge for yourself if she's telling the truth or running from it. Next Thursday. I am very disgusted that Alexandra is involved with these people and that she just doesn't seem to care about anything but her next time. You know Gina? No. Do you know Shane? No. Why did you tweet, please keep my friends Gina and Shane in your prayers? That's not related to them. You know another Shane and Gina? Yes, I do. Was that your truck that was just pulling away? No, it was not my truck that's just pulling away. Your mother says it's your truck. This is Alexandra's truck parked in front of the meth house. Now, did you go 68 days without seeing your children? I'm not going to answer that. Well, it's a little hard to be self-righteous when you have three children and you have custody of none of them. Mm -hmm. After nine years, I want you off the drugs. It all comes down to this. You need to understand if you're not going to do this, I am done with you. Done. That's next week, and you won't want to miss that show. 
it may very well be the last conversation I have with Alexander. If you'd like to comment on the Dr. Phil Family Series or any of our shows for that matter, log on to DrPhil.com and send me an email. We'll see you next time. Dr. Johnson and Dr. Berkeley just pretty much said that I shouldn't have any pain and uh, I shouldn't be on the um, medications that I am. And, and uh, Okay. <laughs> Dr. Berkeley and them, you know, said that uh, that I need detox. I mean, it's not just a okay, just because they say so. That's the way it is. So, you know, I'm not gonna sacrifice in my opinion and my, you know, what I think is right, just because they, Dr. Phil, thinks that these guys are the best of the best. That's his opinion. <laughs> like I said, everybody has their own opinion, and just because he says so doesn't make it so. Today on Dr. Phil. Is she superficial? Very superficial. She says her hubby's not hot enough for her. I want the six pack back. I get her six pack. Six pack of soda, six pack of beer. And she lost 150 pounds. I have a lot of extra skin. It was repulsive. What I think about when I see her skin is put some clothes back on. That tells me that you're not in love with this woman. If he loved you, then he would love you in spite of it. This is going to be a changing day in your life. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. It matters to you. That's what I want to talk about. Are you ready to move? Let's do it. Go, Dr. Bell. Beauty, money, or personality? Now, we ask which quality was most important to you in a mate. We ask on my Facebook page, and you picked personality, right? Now, when you got a head like this, that's good news. Now, I'm not sure I believe those statistics. Well, Sandy says her husband had it all. He had money, he had brains, he had swagger, he had a six-pack. But six years of marriage and a few kids later, she says it's time for him to lose her baby weight. Take a look. On a scale of 1 to 10, when I met Otto, he's definitely 10, 11. And myself, it's the 15, 20. <laughs> when I was pregnant with our first daughter, I packed on a good 40, 45 pounds, and I was a real cow. Put on approximately 35 pounds in the past six years. I call Otto fat ass once a day. Even though I've had two children, Otto's body looks like he's the one who had the two children. That's the baby in there. It's almost due. I'm bikini ready at all times. Bikinis and high heels, that's Sandy. If I were a celebrity, I'd be Pamela Anderson. He's more like a CeeLo, but I'd love it if he looked like David Beckham. Mm. I work out about three days a week. You okay? I push my son around with my heels on because to me, that's a very good workout too. As far as my wife's looks, she gotta stay hot. Same way I married you, the same way I want you. Working hard at my job is very much a priority for me. Working out is not. Hello? Okay, hold on one second. Hello? I work from 18 to 23 hours a day. So you need five cases of flawless? I prefer my pockets fat and I could take a belly with it. My husband does get me everything I ask for, whether it's a purse or a dress or a trip. He's really, really good to me, but I'd like him to be hotter, smoking, can't touch me. We still make love all night, and for a fat man, I don't get winded, I don't run out of breath, and usually it's her that taps out. I would like for Dr. Phil to tell Sandy everybody loves a fat bald guy. I just got to say, he looks in pretty good shape to me. It's the black. It's slimming. <laughs> yeah. How does this affect the way you feel about him? It doesn't affect the way I feel about him, but it affects the way that I feel we look together. Because when we're out, I want everybody to look at us and go, oh, my gosh, why are we not them? I want to be them. That's how I want everybody to look at us. We live in a visual world. People look at us. You want people to say that when they see you? Yeah. 
Why are we not them? Yeah. I why, be why does that matter? Because it does. It matters to me. In my circle, in my world. In, so you in want, the Sandy circle. So you want arm candy. He's got it. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about me. So. No. Yeah. You, oh, you were mean, saying he's got arm candy in you, right? Yeah. But you want arm candy in him. You want somebody where people look, look who she's with. They do look who he's with, but I want them to look even more. Yeah, what My wife you? is black Barbie. The only thing thin in her world is her in the air. That's the only thing that's thin enough. Nothing else. Really? I am. So is she superficial? Very superficial. Really? Very I superficial. I could wear a cape like Supergirl, superficial girl. Woo! <laughs> right, are you still attracted to him? 100%. 100%. Yes. So, so you don't have a problem with it, it's just what other people see. No, I still do, I do. I do have a small problem with it. Not that I would ever leave, because I'm never gonna leave, but I just, I want the six pack back. I wanna be in I sync six pack. six pack of Coke, six pack of soda, <laughs> yeah. beer, whatever. Well, all right. You, you, and I wrote down some of the things you said because I thought these were really interesting. You said, I'm afraid in the future people are going to ask, why is she with him? Yeah. Because you're just too hot to be with someone like that? If he continues the way he's going, imagine how much weight he's going to put on. Within, what, five years, he's put on 35 pounds. So another five years, another 35 pounds. And I'm always going to look like this. So... Oh, really? I am. How do you know that? Because... I was older when I had my first baby, I was 26, had my first kid, and I know what it takes to get the weight off and to look right. And this is what I like to do. This is me, this is Sandy. So you call him Fat Daddy? The kids do, yeah, we call oh, him Fat Daddy. The kids call me Fat Daddy. But wh yeah. where do they get that? Me. They get it, they, they get it from you? Yes. So what do you think about this? I think the only thing I need to do is make more money, and I can let my belly go. I don't care about that. I'm in good shape. I can still walk from here to You're there. You're not in good shape. I'm no. good enough shape. You're not in good and shape. And she, nobody else complains. Are you a good provider? I'm a very good provider. I think... She take good care of you? Yes, very yeah. good care of me. Whatever Sandy wants, Sandy gets. Yeah, my job, my job is to make the money. She just make it look good. That's it. Yeah, but that's not enough for you. You wanted to make the money and look good doing it. Right. Okay, now Otto says Sandy just thinks everyone is too chubby. Now, Sandy's best friend, Cherise, says Sandy says the meanest things to her about her weight. She picks on you, too? Yes. What does she say to you? She calls me Little Debbie. Little Debbie? <laughs> from the Little Debbie Snacks? <laughs> well, you're just pretty proud of the way you turned out, aren't you? <laughs> she said you should wire your jaw shut so you can't talk or eat. <laughs> Why? Why did I say that? Because she calls me and she complains. Oh, I'm this. Oh, I'm that. And I'm like, you know what? If you just wire your jaw shut, you can't call me and complain, and you wouldn't eat, and we're both winning. It's a win-win situation. So you told her you were talking about having a destination wedding, and she said, not at that way? Not at this way. What does that mean? She wanted to get married on the beach. A beach dress requires, you know, slimming. And then afterwards and before, we're going to be on the beach in our bikinis, hanging out, drinking, and partying, and no. Not at this weight. Not that. Yeah. So you ask, is she superficial? Yeah. 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 Come on. No, that, that's a good shirt. You should get in every color, have them make your bathing suit in it, the wedding juice in it. That's a good shirt because it's like a camouflage, so, but it's, it's under there. It's under there. If I wasn't her friend, I wouldn't tell her that. We've been friends for over 10 years, and we first started being friends, we were both same size. Yeah, everybody's body is different, but she needs to work a little bit harder. But I had three kids, Dr. Phil. And I had two. <laughs> but I have three. So what are you going to do? Uh, how are you going to feel when you start picking up a few wrinkles and things start getting a little closer to the sidewalk? <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what are you going to do then? You're not going to look the same in 10 years that you do now. I'm still going to be pretty and I'm still going to be slim. I'm just going to be an older pretty slim woman. An older pretty slim woman? Yes. Yeah. Do you think you're pretty good looking now? Yeah. Oh, she's hot. I can't lie. She's hot. 
So you think you're pretty hot? Yes. Do you have any flaws anywhere? Oh, yeah. What I are do. they? I have issues. Um, I don't really care for my boobs, but with a good bra, and all my bathing suits are custom made, so they always look great, but. I like them. You have no problem. I have no complaints. You have no complaints? That's I have no complaints. All right, we, we gotta take a break. Otto says his wife is not as perfect as she thinks she is. <laughs> so we're gonna find out what he says her weaknesses are when we come back. I'm trying to shape our kids and give them good eating patterns. But when they get with daddy, daddy's like, you can have whatever you'd like. He takes our daughter to the donut shop every morning. And do not tell mommy that I eat donuts. And because I am, like, worried about our kids' weight as punishment, I make them do sit-ups. Do 20 sit-ups. Do 15 sit-ups. Keep talking, that's 10 more sit-ups. When they're 17 in those bathing suits, mom's getting them right. But for now, it feels like punishment. Now, what is your name? Sandy. Okay, because sometimes on tape, you refer to yourself as Sandy. As far I was as just curious if you had, like, it. gone European on us or something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you notice that? I mean, sometimes I it's Sandy, sometimes always. it's Sandy. Yes. Hi, my name is Sandy. <laughs> like Sandy. It's that's, like that's Target your name. and Target. I'm going to Target. No, I'm going to Target. Sounds better. Where do you get your clothes? Um, I like BB. I like Gas. I like Gucci. I like Donna Karen. She's, so she's a label whore. I'm a label whore. She's yeah. a label whore. <laughs> and then how about the shoes? Oh, these are BB. Oh. Those are BBs? Yes, BB. Is that is that a short for something else or is that the real name? No, it's just <laughs> I don't know. All right. Macy's and Nordstrom's. Then all the all the labels underneath one roof. Boom. So you got it. You got it. You got it. Do they love to dress you. Whom? No, I. The dress stores. Myself. I mean, do they love to? Yeah, I pick you know? up my own things. I don't even like when they come to me and say, "Are you looking for something?" I got it. I know what I'm looking for. I don't need your help. I'll let you know when I'm ready to pay. Yeah. Actually, I'll let him know when I'm ready to pay. <laughs> yeah. So he can get his fat ass over and pay for it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Man, come play for this. Yeah. I don't even call him honey. I call him money, money, I'm ready. And he's like on the cell phone. I'm like, money, come to you. He's coming. Yeah. He so she it. doesn't call you fat ass when it's time to pay. Oh, no, no. It's, I'm, I'm the best thing in the world. Hey, honey, honey. But then she calls me fat ass when we're leaving the store. Yeah. Hey, fat ass, get the door. Well, you know, I want to know what the audience thought. So I asked today's audience how much weight their spouse could gain before it became a problem in their relationship. Now, a third of you said no amount would keep you from seeing your spouse's inner beauty. So it just didn't matter. Another quarter of the audience would complain if their partner gained 25 pounds. So that's like almost half of you would have a problem if, if they gained 25 pounds. Really? I see. But yet, 90% of people say personality. That doesn't seem to add up, does it? No. Do you like the way you look? I love the way. Come on, man. Look, I'll make this suit look good. Come on, man. This suit looks good. It looks good, man. I like it. I don't need to lose no weight. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting older. I'm not a young man. I got to look like a grown, mature man. Yeah. So you want a little beef? Yeah. A little beef. I got yeah. two daughters. I got to protect them. Who's going to respect some little skinny guy running up? Hey, leave my daughters alone. <laughs> So, what are you going to do if he doesn't decide to go on this Sandy program? Keep calling him a fat ass. Yeah? Yeah. I'm not going on the program. He's not. You're not going to do it. No, we signed up before for a yeah. gym membership, and we had personal training, and he never came, and I ended up using all his sessions because he could never make it. Yeah. I made it. And I made it out the gym. <laughs> yeah. Made it in and out. Do you, do you play any sports? Do you like sports? No, I'm... You know what? I'm a workaholic. It's like I, I, I work, I work, I work. I barely get time to do anything like that. Most of my free time is spent with my wife and my kids. So. Yeah. You do want to take care of your health, right? Yes. I mean, course. seriously, because you do have kids. So forget about Sandy wanting you to be good arm candy. Sandy! <laughs> wanting you to be good arm candy. For her, you want to have longevity in your life. And for every 10 pounds you put on, you do shave years off your life. If you could drop 10 or 20 pounds and you could be around for your girls, say, an extra five or ten years, that would be worth it, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be worth it. Yeah, well, I'm going to show you some stats on that. You'll be interested to see that it might make a difference. 
but not because of what she's saying. Just think about it. <laughs> All right. Now, next, he thought his girlfriend was hot until she got undressed. <laughs> now their relationship is in limbo. Now, we're going to talk to them when we come back. I never have connected with somebody as well as I have with Donna, but I'm not attracted to her body. The excess skin is repulsive. It makes me feel less of a person. What I think about when I see her skin is put some clothes back on. Now, this was Dawn before she lost 150 pounds. Then she met the man she says she hopes to marry. Paul said sparks flew until he saw her in a bathing suit. Two years later, Paul says he loves Dawn, but is not in love with her, and here's why he says that. I got the gastric bypass surgery, and I lost 155 pounds. I feel better at 40 than I ever felt at 25. I never have connected with somebody as well as I have with Don, emotionally, spiritually, but I'm not attracted to her body. Since my surgery, I have a lot of excess skin on my arms, on my stomach, on my thighs. When I saw the excess skin, I was just flabbergasted. Wow. It was repulsive, and it was like seeing a young, healthy woman in an 80-year-old body. You do not notice the excess skin when I'm dressed, because I hide it pretty well. Dawn's skin looks like a giant pork rind wrapped around her stomach. I did want to have sex with her, but what I think about when I see her skin is put some clothes back on. <laughs> Paul said that it was gross, and he could not have sex with me. It just devastated me. It makes me feel less of a person. It is difficult to get turned on by somebody who looks like that. You want to look away. You don't want to look at it. He actually started dating another girl. It made me feel inferior, and it just broke my heart. I have not been exclusive with Don. Physical attraction is very important to me. I wish Don had a body like Jennifer Aniston. It bothers me very much that Paul does not want to have sex with me. Don and I have talked about marriage in the past, but if she didn't have the surgery to remove that excess skin, I feel like I'd be settling if I married her. The girls that Paula has dated in the past have not made him happy, and I feel that I can make him happy. I do feel like I could get a better looking woman. I don't want a perfect 10, I just want somebody who's normal. Well, they say they have a plan to rid Don's body of the excess skin. The problem He's putting the plan into action because Paul says he's struggling with the idea of going all in on this relationship. The plastic surgeries that I want to get are pretty radical. I want to get a complete body lift. The surgery will cost over $16,000, so she needs help financing the surgery. It's a big risk to front somebody fifteen dollars to $20,000. The pressure's on me now. As soon as I swipe that card and, and sign that away, it's a full court press. It's emotionally stressful, it's financially stressful, it's a gamble. And it's pulling the trigger on that uh, when you're not in love, you know, everything's on the line here. Paul has two fears when it comes to my plastic surgeries. One, that it won't work, the scarring will be too bad. Or two, It'll work too good, and then I'll look too hot, and I'll want to leave him for somebody else. There's a chance that she could have the surgery, get really hot, and move on to something bigger and better. OK. So tell me how you think your position and your attitude affects her. I do think it uh, offends her uh, how I feel and hurts her feelings, but I also know that she understands that I'm not the first guy that has been down this road with her. Uh-huh. So what do you think about this? I'm frustrated, and it sucks, <laughs> plain and simple, because he is my best friend, yeah. and I'm never connected with anybody more than him. Yeah. And it just, it, I mean, he's not the only person that's told me this. And I, I was just hoping that when we had such a good connection that the physical would, we could work through it. I mean, what you could say is 
you're worth shooting the dice for 15, 20 grand. And we've discussed that though, and we have a plan, we have a budget worked out, and just he just, just he's not afraid. Worth, he's I not mean, worth the risk. I guess, yeah, reward's not worth the risk because he feels like he, he's going to get screwed over. Because basically, he was going to front the money, but then you were going to pay for it, right? Right. right. So it isn't even really your money. She right. was, she was going to actually pay for it herself. Right. You were just going to front the money. Right. I mean, fifteen to 20000 to to sign a, off on just like that is something that I just don't rush into. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> no, I, I, that's, a, that's a significant amount of money, right? We're not married. Uh, all right, if Dawn goes through with the surgeries, will that be enough for Paul to marry her? Now, my thoughts on this when we come back. Paul does keep his ex-girlfriends in his life because he's afraid to let go of possibilities. He does date hot party girls because he wants to have fun and go out and party. I wish Paul would grow up. I'm still at the point where I want to be with attractive women, and I find Don physically unattractive. If this was all gone from her, would, would you be pursuing her to marry her? Yeah, I would be going, we'd be definitely having a romantic connection, and there's a lot of things that I, I love about Don. And I know looks aren't everything, but without that physical attraction, how can you get the romance going? I mean, I get it. I get it. I do. I hate looking at it, too. I mean, how can I expect somebody to be physically attracted to me when I can't even stand looking in the mirror? Okay, listen, I understand that you want to improve your, your body image. What I can't understand is why it's okay with you to be with somebody that tells you in every way he knows how you are not good enough and furthermore, you're not worth the gamble to get good enough. That, 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 that says two things to me. Number one, it tells me that your self-esteem is really compromised. Right. That you're willing to, to take that from somebody and it tells me that you're not in love with this woman. Because if you were, if you were in love with her, then you would be part of the solution, not part of the problem. You would be saying, I love you, and I will do, I will do whatever it takes for both of us to get comfortable in this situation and scenario. And you're right, my self-esteem is somewhat low because I've had multiple guys before him tell me the same thing and the same issue. And so it's like, why lose my best friend when if I go out there and whoever I date, they're going to have the same problem. Okay, you may want to fix this for you. I do. But, but let me, and, and if you do, the, I understand that. There are, there are right reasons and wrong reasons to have plastic surgery. Sure. This is a right reason. I mean, you have had a major body r reconfiguration. It, it's left you with, with excess tissue that you don't need. Exactly. And, and you don't want. But here's your problem. And I've seen this happen so many times when women, usually it's a woman, get something like this done and then somebody says, okay, now that you've lost the weight, now that you've had the surgery, now that you've made these changes, now I lust after you. And at that point, your body image is going to be improved. Mm -hmm. Your self-image is probably going to be improved. Mm -hmm. And you are at real risk of looking at him and saying, well, you know what? I wasn't good enough for you before, yeah. so you ain't good enough for me now. I'm just telling you, I, I, I've, seen it, I've seen this happen an awful lot. If we weren't best friends and if we didn't have the connection that we do have, um, I think it would be easier to leave. And I've never connected with somebody so much that it's so important to me to keep him in my life but I want to do it for me. I want to do it because I want to be sexy for whoever I'm with, if it's Paul or not Paul. I want to look sexy for me. And then that way, my partner's happy, and I know that I've done everything I can to make him happy. Best friends don't hurt best friends. But if I didn't feel this way about myself, if, if I felt okay with what I look like and he was telling me I wasn't perfect, then I could see that being a problem. But I'm not happy with it. So it, 
I mean, but are you happy thing. with you? Yeah, absolutely. Do you like I mean, your personality? I'm intelligent. I, you know, I have my master's degree. I went to school and worked hard. I have a great job. I'm a giving person. You know, I take care of people. I love everything about me. The one thing I don't, I think the, the one thing that's holding me back with having what I want out of life is the skin. Uh -huh. That is an ugly, disgusting reminder of the past that I don't want to see anymore. Uh -huh. I'm tired of it. And every time I look in the mirror, I know from here up, I love what I see and I know I'm a good person. But I'm tired of being reminded of that fat girl that I used to be. Mm -hmm. I don't want to remember that I was 300 pounds because I'm happy with being 145 pounds and I'm never going to go back there. But I don't want to look at it anymore. It's, it's like these tumors on my body that nobody will help me get rid of because I don't have $16,000. And now I'm going to lose the love of my life because of it, because of some stupid skin. If your love of your life would withhold himself from you and would not commit to you, not even gamble on you, over some stupid skin, as you call it, why would you settle for that? And that's just, that's just what you say, right? That's who you are. You're saying, that's how I feel. You're just being honest. And I, I'm glad you're being honest, but I think your truth, the truth about which you are being honest, is a, it should be offensive to you. It is. I get it should be offensive to you. If we're not able to get romantic, I'm, I'm not able to, to, to let it flow, you know? We're just still in the friend zone with each other, and... I mean, but we do, we, we do get flirty, and we do hug, and, you know, we have a great time, but we just don't cross that line to intimacy because... It's part of it, its respect, you I know? mean, it, you know... Respect it, for her exactly. and not leading her down that, that road and using her. I don't think people think that's respect for her. I think it's that you think it's gross, so you don't want to do it. Well, I'm respecting the fact that you don't have sex before marriage. So you're married to these other girls you're having sex with? No. I'm, no, I'm saying. Well, you said it. I, I'm just asking. Yeah. You said I respect that you just don't have sex before marriage, but you, you say you're sleeping with these other girls? I'm not saying that I'm sleeping with these other girls. Um, I might have ro romantic uh, dates with these other girls, but who says that I'm actually sleeping with any of these girls? Are you? I'm not. Is that so wrong these days to... I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying, so, so you're, you're having romantic dates with these other girls that you're Listen. not willing to do with her. What are you doing with them that you're not willing to do with her? Well, I'm not saying that I've never had sex before outside of marriage. I've never been married before. But with Don, I want to do it right. And it, especially with what I'm dealing with and what we're, what we're looking at here, in regards to the excess skin, it's hard for me to get romantic. Right, right. You made a decision you're not interested in doing this with her. Well, not at this point where we're not married, we don't live together. But see, that's just it. He, we're not married and we don't live together, so he won't take the gamble. But then we can't get married and live together until we get it fixed. So it's like in a catch-22. Yeah. So what, what, do I, what do I do? And, you know, I'm in a dilemma uh, about this, frankly, because, you know, I can help you get this done. And I want to do that. I, I want to help you get this done. But I feel like by doing that, I'm feeding into the toxic nature of this relationship. Really? But why, why is it toxic to the fact that he's being honest with me? I mean, well, all, the, all these other guys have said the exact same thing, and it, they haven't been willing to stick around for even a, you know, a little bit. It's toxic because if he loved you, then he would love you through it. He would say, look, I love you. 
and you are good enough for me, and we can work together to, to do this for both of us, but that's not what he's saying. But I think he, I think, I think he loves me as his best friend, but he doesn't love me as the woman he wants to marry right now. But when it comes down to it, if a man, if a man is not attracted to his wife, He's going to be looking at other women. He's going to be looking at other things. All right. Should I help her do this? No. Or is it, a, I mean, is, it, is it unhealthy to do this? I mean, what do you think? You know, I really have a dilemma. I'm, being, I'm just being honest. Because I think, I, I, I'm being honest because I think you are being very superficial. And maybe she's not the one for you, and maybe you don't love her. And if so, you should just say that. But I think you're being, I, I think you're being, I, I think this falls below the standard of what I know with 35 years of experience, this falls below the standard. If, if he really loved you, and he, he was really committed to you, then this wouldn't matter. This would be something that went on the to-do list. I agree. And if I felt that you were saying, I'm going to do this for me, whether he's here or whether he's not, then I would feel very differently about it. But I think you're doing it to please no. him. Oh, no. No. no Absolutely not. not. If, if Paul are not in my life, I still want, like I said, I want to get this done for me because I hate wearing a swimsuit. I hate going shopping. I mean, my clothes pinch me. I, I get rashes. I, I just, I feel like when I look in the mirror, you know what I feel like? I feel like a candle, a little candles object that's been sitting too close to the fire and is just melting. And it's disfigured. And it's disgusting. And how can I go on with life with this stuff hanging on me that just is an ugly reminder of being 300 pounds? I mean, seriously. I'm to the point where if I, if I can't get this taken care of, I, I'm just, I'm just, I don't know what I'm going to do. I really don't know what I'm going to do because I don't want to be alone for the rest of my life, but I know that the men aren't going to accept me, and I'm not doing it for the men. I'm not. A lot of people think I am, but I'm not. When I weighed 300 pounds, I was not attractive. I felt like a big blob. Look at that. I felt like a big blob, and I worked hard. I worked hard to lose 150 pounds. I worked hard. I almost died twice. All right, I'm going to think about this. I, I'm, I'm going to think about this. I, I, I really am. I have a real problem with this dynamic. Let me think about this, okay? I'm going to take a break. I'm going to talk to the next couple that are here, and then and I'm going to be thinking about this. So right back. Sal's 50, but he looks 60. Sal thinks he's gorgeous. I've never had a problem with the ladies. My only problem with Sal is that I am not physically attracted to him. Before we meet my next guest, take a look at these pictures. Tell me how old you think she is. 50, 30, Just shout it out. 30, 30, 30. All right, okay. I hear a lot of you saying 35. Now take a look at this guy. Tell me how old you think he is. Okay, all right. I hear most of you saying 60 ish. All right, well, this is Cynthia, and her actual age is 45. This is her boyfriend, Sal, and he's 50. Well, Cynthia's been dating Sal for about a year, and she says she absolutely loves this man, but she is embarrassed by his looks on the outside. Take a look. I love Sal. I love the way Sal makes me feel, like I'm the only woman on this planet. My only problem with Sal is that I am not physically attracted to him. Sal is 50, but he looks 60. Sal thinks he's gorgeous. On a scale of one to 10, I give myself a ton. I've never had a problem with the ladies. He's, he has no sense of style. No, he's still stuck in the 70s. Looks ridiculous. He wears sloppy clothes. I'm a mechanic, so when I come home, I take a shower and I put jeans back on. Okay, how about that one? It's from 1987. I feel like I can dress up with the best of them. 
Sal's idea of dressing up is coming out of the bedroom in a pair of boots and polyester pants with a t-shirt on. I can't even take it seriously. What am I supposed to do? That's not funny to me. That makes me mad. I haven't told my three children about Sal because I'm embarrassed about how he looks. I'm going to be like mom, for real. You get this, don't you? Sandy, you get I'm this. I'm embarrassed. In Sandy's world, you get this. You two can hang. Probably, yeah. You know, I get my hair done, I get my nails done, I get my toes done. I do all kinds of things to be attractive for him. Plus, because that's the way I live my life. But If he worked he, at it, would it matter? I think so, yeah. And I, I say things all the time. But he's, he's like, what's wrong with okay, the way I look? Because I will say this. I, I will say this to you and, and to you both. I do think things that you can work on, things that you can do to please your partner, I think that's healthy. I think it's okay. Right. I mean, I'm if you asking, make an effort. Yeah, I'm not asking him to get plastic surgery or anything. He's got a yeah. belly. I don't care about his belly. I shake it. I don't care. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the hair and the, you know, the clothes. Oh, God, the clothes. The clothes. <laughs> All right, well... I'm so afraid of what he's coming out of. Okay, so they've been dating for eight months. And so I said, okay, I do think it's reasonable to work on yourself and present yourself as, as best you can. Now, her big concern is that he looks much older than she does. So we spruced him up a little bit in terms of his, of his hair and in terms of his wardrobe. So, Sal, come on out. You want a little digress? <laughs> okay. Now, first off, how do you think he looks? He looks completely different. I don't know what I like. <laughs> no. Yeah, I think so. It's going to take a little time to get used to it. Yeah, he yeah. looks completely different. Well, the hair's different. The mustache is gone. You dress sharp. I mean, you look good. Wow. Thank I you. mean, it's not like I got a man crush on you, but you look good. <laughs> well, I like myself, too, when I looked in the mirror. Did you? Did oh, you yeah. like the way you look? Oh, yeah. You see, I, th I think if to the extent that we can be sensitive to our partners, I think it's a good thing, right? Oh, yeah. But you made an effort here. Do you respect the effort? Absolutely. How do you think he looks? He looks uh, wonderful. You think he looks, uh, <laughs> you think he looks better? Yes, he looks better. So, and tell me what you think about your look. When you looked in the mirror, what'd you think? Oh, I thought I was hot. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, the difference it made a big difference. I mean, just getting rid of the mustache and a little bit of the gray, yeah, made a big difference. Yeah. So, so would you be embarrassed to go out with him now? No. You embarrassed to sit here with him? Absolutely not. Yeah. Are you pleased? I am very pleased. So you're happy with this? See, yes. It's easy. It takes so little effort sometimes to please your partner. So that's what we wanted to do. Okay, we're going to move on. When we come back, I'm going to tell Don what I think. The question is, do I think it's reasonable and healthy to help her get this body makeover, or is that just playing into a really bad dynamic that's going to lead her to getting hurt in the future? Decision time when we come back. <laughs> well, we've been talking today about this simply sometimes people think their partner's just not hot enough. So the question, and I'm seldom without an opinion, you know, not always right, but never in doubt, as they say. Um, so the question is, is it healthy for me to do this for you, or is it just simply playing into what I think is an unhealthy relationship dynamic? So my question is, do I arrange to have this surgery done for you, or do I not? And uh, I'm curious what you think. If you think that I should not do it because it just plays into the bad aspect of this relationship, stand up. Okay, a lot of people say no. If you think no, you should do it, stand up. Um, okay. Well, I, I decided before I took the vote, uh, <laughs> I, I did, um, but I am going to do this. Yeah. 
And we contacted Dr. Craig Hobar. He's a plastic surgeon in Don's hometown. He's been in practice for 20 years, and when he heard about Don's dilemma, he generously stepped up to partner with us in, in getting this done for you. And you have to pass a psych evaluation, which I have every confidence that you will. Then he's going to be performing the surgeries, because it's multiple, yes. that we talked about. And we're going to follow you through this process. And then I want you to come back here with Dr. Hobar. You and Dr. Hobar come back here after all of this is done, if you and he decide that it's medically sound for you to do this. So I am going to make this available to you. Thank you so and much. And my primary reason, and I have concerns, because I, I think this is not a good dynamic here. I don't think there's a great future here. And I simply didn't think that I should penalize you because of him. Okay? And if you had come here by yourself without him, and I heard everything that you had to say and the reasoning behind it, then I would have wanted to do what I could to help you. So I'm kind of doing this in spite of your relationship, because I don't think it's healthy. And a lot of people here think you're going to wind up kicking him to the curb when this is over. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but we're going to follow you along with this, and I wish you the best of Thank luck. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here so long. Dr. Phil, absent dad. You need to go see your daughter. Or could his ex-wife. He was crummy to her. He dumped her with no warning. And mother-in-law. Have you teamed up in threatening him? We did make some threats. Be keeping him away. It's never been my intention to lock him out. Oh, really? Let's look at what social services says. You should have come see her regardless of what was happening. Oh, crawl down off your high horse, lady. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here I hate to see people suffering, and you've heard long enough. Stand by, Dr. Phil. Both of you, take We're going to get you the help that you need. Three, five, four, This is going to be a changing day in your life. This is 18-month-old Ellie. She was born three months premature, weighed a little over a pound, and had only a 10% chance of surviving. Now, she spent five months in the NICU and has been in and out of the hospital eight times since. Ellie has a trach tube, a feeding tube, is unable to talk, and must live in a completely sterile environment. However, the problem we're focusing on today isn't Ellie's health. It's her parents who just can't seem to get along. Candace claims her ex-husband, Miguel, is an absent father who has abandoned her and their precious daughter. Miguel is a deadbeat absentee father. Miguel has visited Ellie two times since he abandoned us. He will say that he's coming and then right at the last minute say, oh, I'm sick. Miguel uses the bad relationship between himself and my mom as a crutch to not have anything to do with Ellie. Miguel is very full of excuses. My daughter has a tracheostomy and she has a feeding tube. Miguel knows absolutely nothing about how to take care of Ellie and all of her medical needs. I believe Miguel has chosen his new wife over his disabled daughter. Well, Miguel says, whoa, 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 that is completely untrue. He says he is desperate to see his daughter, but that he can't because Candace holds her hostage at his ex-mother-in-law's house. Now, he claims both women are to blame. My ex-wife, Candace, is a vindictive, jealous, habitual liar. One of the main reasons I wasn't able to visit Ellie was because around March, Candace's mother had sent me some seriously nasty text messages telling me that under no circumstances, as long as my daughter is under her roof, that I will ever see my little girl. I took Candace to the court for contempt because they were keeping me out of the house. That's why I can't make the six-hour trip. They're vindictive enough and have been to where I could get five hours into my six-hour trip and they could just change something up on me in a heartbeat to where 
I wouldn't be able to see her or your time's gonna be limited. I, they're just playing games with me. It kills me not to be with my little girl. Well, the only thing Candace and Miguel agree on is that they disagree on everything. Just months ago, Candace claims Miguel took his desperation to a dangerous level, threatening her safety as well as their daughters. There was one time when Ellie went into the hospital and I was continuing to keep Miguel updated as much as possible, but most of those texts or phone calls were being ignored. After Candace told me that Ellie was in the hospital, I asked her, how is she doing? And she refused to tell me. She just said, she's at the hospital, it's bad. I was like, just let me know what her security code is if she gets admitted so I can call and talk to her in the hospital. She refused to give me this code. So I then contacted the hospital myself. They said, hold on, we got her in the ER. The ER then sent me to to the OR, which I was freaking out, thinking, did my daughter have surgery? Is she having surgery? What's going on? And then the OR basically is like, oh, no, 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 she's on the eighth floor. I'm like, I'm Ellie's father. I'm just trying to see how she's doing. And she's like, there's no Ellie here, sir. We can't tell you anything. And at the time, I got extremely frustrated. Two people plus Candace just confirmed that my daughter's in the hospital. And now this lady is denying that my daughter even exists. I said, this is ridiculous. I am going to just sue the whole hospital for everything you guys have. Because the secretary would not allow him to have access to her information, Miguel threatened to kill me and shoot up every nurse in the hospital if they didn't give him the GD information on his GD daughter. The nurses were on alert. Police officers were guarding the hospital. Candace texted me. She's like, are you stupid? They told me that you were going to come in here and shoot me in the head, and you said that explicitly and all these kind of crazy, crazy things. The only thing I could think of is that she took, I'm going to sue the hospital, I shoot the hospital. Those hospital threats did prove how irrational, scary, and terrorizing Miguel can be. This is another example of my ex-wife, Candace, just being a complete liar and being completely vindictive against me and trying to keep me from seeing my little girl. Yeah. So you say he's just absent, he's abandoned her. Yes, I do. I feel like he just doesn't care about her, and if he does, he has a really terrible way of showing it. Okay, well, the separation agreement says he can see his daughter any time that he wants. Right. And you say, despite that, he has seen her twice in, what, 10 months? Yeah, something between, um, let's say, April of 2013 and currently. And the last time he saw her was four months ago. Right. He's not plugged in. Right. He's totally, he knows Is nothing. that true? No, I, I'm trying to be plugged in as much as I can. Well, why aren't you? Because I tried to... Your daughter, the court says you can see her. Why aren't yeah. you seeing her? Because when I, when I went to go down see her, that's when her mother would send me those messages saying you cannot you come see her, her daughter under, no matter, under any circumstances. There's been false accusations against my family and things of that nature, and they won't allow me to bring her other family to come see her or anything like that, and I can't take the chance of being within that home with her whole family around of other accusations of happening. Okay, but this is your daughter... And you have the right to see her according to the court. So why would you react to, or give your power away to somebody sending you an email? Somebody sends you a text message, you says, you're a slime ball. I hate you. Don't come around here. Well, you have a court order that says you can. Why would you not do it? I guess I, I was so afraid of going down. I was trying to do the best I could to keep peace. I truly was, and that's something that I definitely regret. I regret not going down there and just knocking on the door. Even if the door was closed in my face, I should have called the police and taken it from that You stance. want to talk about peace? <clears throat> Are you kidding me? Your idea of peace is sending text messages to me where you're screaming and cussing at me and calling me every name in the book. That is not peace. That is a flat-out lie, and you know it. Okay, well, here's what the court says that you have the right to do. This is the finding of fact. It says, quote, while Eleanor has her tracheotomy, and her gastrointestinal tube, father may come to the residence of wife to visit Eleanor whenever he wishes. Wife wishes to encourage this contact and shall accommodate this visit by allowing liberal amounts of time for husband and Eleanor to spend peaceful time together. Is that happening? No, it's not. You're not happening. going, and she's not allowing liberal time and peaceful time. And my biggest... My biggest issue is that peaceful time, because there's times where I'm like, hey, can I have a, am, am I going to have a peaceful time? You know, am I going to be able to sit in a room alone with my daughter? And she's like, there are no private rooms in this house. Her. Why would you sit in a room with a child you don't know how to take care of? Every time you've been in the hospital with her, you can't even change her diaper. They haven't allowed well, me well, to change her diaper. maybe the reason he doesn't know is because you've locked him out. 
It's never been my intention to lock him out. Oh, really? On that note, we need to take a break. Next, I want to talk about what the social worker said really went down at the hospital. Little video of you need to man up and go room. see your daughter. Thank I don't you. care what the hell somebody says. Thank to you. you. Thank you. Oh, crawl down off your high horse, lady. The social services record says the social worker allegedly blamed her, you, for not giving your ex-husband the patient's FIN number so he can get medical updates from the staff. Mom was adamant that she is not going to leave patient's room under any circumstances. Social worker reiterated to mom that both have shared custody and he is allowed to visit separately given their volatile history. Candace advised hospital security will be contacted should she agree not to leave the room and security will have her escorted. This mom repeated numerous times that she will not leave the room and let the dad have private visits with the patient. Hospital security will be notified upon dad's arrival. He has allowed the patient's FIN number that mom hesitantly agreed. Mom said she felt it is unfair that patient's dad be allowed to have private visits with his daughter. Okay, can I explain a little bit of that? Uh, you need to, yes, because that <laughs> because to me sounds like you are being highly does. obstructionistic. That makes me sound crazy. But and in fact, you. you wanted a new social worker because this one didn't agree with you. The problem was when he contacted me for the FIN number, it was 4.30 in the morning. My daughter had had a really rough night. We were in the emergency room for 16 hours. She texted me at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was letting him know what, I was letting him know what was going on via text Why not message. give him the number? Because I was asleep. You weren't asleep during your meetings with the social worker, were you? No, I was not. A, I was not. Then why were you continuing to say that, the, uh, that the, her father does not even have the right to have the access number to get medical updates on his daughter? In hindsight, I should have just given it to him. I, you're right. I'm not going to, I will own that. I will say that I should have given it to him. So, so why did you want to fire this social worker? Because she's telling because you what you don't want to hear. I have had a really rough history with that social worker. This is one that has terrorized me in different ways and I know that probably just seems like I'm just calling people out and calling people crazy and not owning so it. So you were terrorized by a social worker? Yes. She threatened to call social service, she threatened to call D DHS on me because my daughter spent a lot of time in the hospital for trach infections and she was saying that I was actually making her sick. I never was making my daughter sick. And so this social worker has called me names and accused me of things that were not true. Now, any... She's called you names. What has what she called She's you? called me a bad mother, and I, um, I'm one that tries to cause problems between uh, the nurses and the doctors, and well, I'm those very... sound like clinical observations, not names. But she doesn't have the right to make clinical observations. She doesn't have a medical degree. Well, she's licensed to make those observations and assigned to the case. All I know so is... So what is she supposed to do? She's supposed to... The job of a social worker is to make sure you have help with aftercare. You have to have, like, um, your supplies and stuff delivered. They're the ones that re... That restart. Well, where did you read that that's the job of the social worker? <laughs> because I've spent a lot of time in the hospital with my daughter. <laughs> I mean, I pretty much know, like, things that they're supposed to be doing. And doctors have even told so me that that's not So you understand what the congressional mandate is for the Licensing well, Act no, of Social Workers? I don't understand what the congressional mandate is, but I do understand what doctors have told me when they've said that it's not her place to make those kinds of calls. Really? Let's see if, if, if you've been cooperative here. Um, I haven't been. I'm uh, on, <laughs> not as much as I should. On May 4th of 13, you write to Miguel, we hit a milestone tonight. You couldn't even care less. <laughs> Miguel says, just woke up. What is the milestone? Candace, laugh out loud. Oh, you're going to act like you care this morning? Thought you had a trip with your precious Ugg this weekend. Now, who would Ugg be? His wife. She has a name. I know. She has a name. Miguel, what's the milestone, Candace? How is our daughter doing? You respond, you would know if you hadn't ditched her. <sighs> Candace, 
Does it not bother you a tiny bit that our daughter is trying to crawl today and you're not here to see it? Sad, Miguel, absolutely sad. Miguel says, so that's the milestone that you're telling me about? Candace, no, it isn't. This is new. Doesn't matter. You're not here to see it. She, she acts like I don't care about my little girl. You my need to man up and go see your daughter. Thank I don't you. care what the hell somebody's saying Thank to you. you. Thank you. It does not matter what I say. You should have come see her regardless of what was happening. Oh, crawl down off your high horse, lady. You set him up for failure. I did. And, and then you criticize him when you win. It sounds to me like you are a woman scorned. In ways, it sounds yes. to me that you are pissed off that he has moved on. Oh, no. And that you are using your daughter as a pawn in order to get back at him. No, it has nothing to do with the fact that he's moved on. Oh, I... that's why you call her Ugg instead no. of Cynthia? Because... I mean, what are we, two years old? Yeah, you're right. But at this point in time, currently, I do not... But you still to... think she's a skank and a whore and white trash and all no, the no, other no, those things. were not my words. <laughs> yeah. I didn't say those words. Yes, some of those came from your mother. Uh, yes, who's... some of those... The most... At least we've got somebody mature here. <laughs> uh, coming up, we're going to meet the woman Miguel says is the mastermind behind Candace's vindictive motives. It's been six months since Miguel has seen his ex-mother-in-law, but he's going to see her next. Leah sent a lot of texts to Candace on the day of our wedding. She said, you're becoming an inward lover. I told him, Miguel, I said, I've called you plenty of things. A stupid punk, a mama's boy, a liar, a cheater, but I have never called you the inward. When we were together, Miguel would control all of our finances. Miguel would question me about where I went, how long I was there, who I was with. At one point, he would take my phone with him to work because he was afraid that I would have contact with my family. Miguel had me convinced that my mom would tear us apart, that she was toxic for me. My mom is not controlling me. Miguel is the controlling one. Miguel hasn't seen his ex-mother-in-law in six months. He says she's so toxic, her own daughter cut ties with her while they were married. Take a look. Leah sent a lot of texts to Candace on the day of our wedding, basically telling her that you're making a huge mistake, he's terrible for you. She said a lot of things like, you're becoming an inward lover. That is a lie, and he knows it. He brought that up to me and told me that I called his father the N-word and that I called him the N-word. I told him, I said, I've called you plenty of things, a stupid punk, a mama's boy, a liar, a cheater, but I have never called you the N-word. Candace's mother, Leah, is a manipulator, a vindictive person, someone who always has to have drama in her life. Miguel has a very bad temper. He will start to scream and cuss and immediately start calling names. Miguel has called me the word, an b, a whore, a slut, stupid, insignificant, and a loser. Miguel told me he didn't want to sit at the same table with me because he said that I was fat and disgusting. I don't believe I ever called her overweight, but gross and disgusting is very possible. On the outside, Miguel appears very sweet and charming, but in reality, he is a very skilled liar. Well, Leah, thanks for joining us. Did you want her to marry him? No, I did not. Uh, were you happy when she did? No, I was not. Okay, have you teamed up with her in threatening him and trying to keep him away from seeing his child? We did make some threats at the beginning, but we have really moved so far past that. Uh, Leah, you even come close to this house, I will have you arrested. Do you understand, you stupid, disgusting punk? And then you perch up here and say, he won't come see his daughter. <laughs> but we've tried to 
go past that is what I'm trying to say. This all was right after so the adult the divorce. Point. We were all so angry at the time, but we've tried to move past that. But he still won't come see her. He still acts like she doesn't exist. You have called Miguel punk, trash, deadbeat, stupid, idiot, loser, mama's boy, ignorant, and crybaby. Uh, the only good thing you've ever done was supply a tiny piece of DNA. <laughs> I'm so then sorry for you. you <laughs> sent a text message that referred to UG, is it? Uh, which I like to call Cynthia, uh, calling her cheap, trashy witch, picked up on the streets, tramp, and white trash. Well, I mean, seriously, he, she walked in and stole my daughter's husband from her. I mean, I was mad. I'm not denying that for a minute. I was mad as a hornet. Why is it okay for him to call me on the phone and say these nasty things to me, but he, it's somehow not okay for us to come back? He to dumped him? her on, at my house with no warning, abandoned her and the baby with no warning, and then took up with somebody that he had been talking no to. Warning. for There was a complete plan of to her for to who, spend time uh, That at is your in house. your head, and you know it. Did and you? then before we knew it, he was engaged again. So you tell me that you didn't, hadn't already had it planned to take up with somebody else. Not at all. Uh, oh, I, my gosh. No, I now is the have, only time you have a chance to be honest. Please do yeah, that. Please I, do I, I've been nothing but honest from the whole get-go. Yeah, try it. Maybe it'll get contagious. <laughs> <laughs> right, right from... Right from care of that baby day in and day out. I don't know why everybody's acting like that it's our fault, all our fault. Who's everybody? Every time he says something, they applaud like he's some great speaker. Well, this isn't an election. <laughs> Th this is just a conversation. I mean, come on, you've got to own the fact. I Look, you're the, you're the adult here, right? I own every stupid thing I did. I know how immature and stupid and angry I why was. Why did you do that? Because I was mad. That's, oh, well. She's my daughter. Well, there's one more player in this mix. Oh, here we, go. we might as well get her out here. Up next, for the first time, Candace will meet the woman she suspects was cheating with her ex-husband while they were still married. The woman she refers to as Ugg. <laughs> After anymore. the break. Not anymore. <laughs> I'm very afraid that Cynthia is an alcoholic. Cynthia is trash. I think anybody that purposely goes in and messes up somebody's marriage, what else are you going to call them? My relationship with Miguel is perfect, except for the issues with Candace and her mother. They are teenagers. I have never met Miguel's new wife, Cynthia. I've seen her from a distance and seen pictures of her. I've seen many photos of Cynthia drinking alcohol. I don't like to judge like that, but I do believe she might at least have a drinking problem. I am very afraid that Cynthia is an alcoholic. Cynthia appears to me as somebody who hasn't grown up, somebody who is selfish, who wants what doesn't belong to her. Cynthia appears to me as somebody who might just be as mean and vindictive as Miguel is. My nickname for Cynthia is I believe she is a big word. I think she's trash. I think anybody that purposely goes in and messes up somebody's marriage, what else are you going to call them? After Miguel dumped Candace and Ellie, we saw Facebook pictures and posts of Cynthia and Miguel within a matter of weeks. Miguel's in a relationship with Cynthia, hugging each other and sharing their holidays. It's disgusting. I wanted to slap his head off, and I wanted to slap her head off, too. Cynthia stole my daughter's husband. I think Cynthia would love to steal Ellie. My biggest issue with Cynthia is not so much that she's with Miguel. I believe that she has inserted herself into Ellie's life and trying to be a step parent to a child she doesn't know. I just don't want to bring a stranger like that around my daughter. Leah, you had said earlier that all of this name calling and immaturity oh, and want to slap their heads off and everything was early on when you I were know. really upset, but that you had matured through that. I know. We taped, th we taped this yesterday. yesterday. I know. Uh, I was thinking that while I was yeah, saying just, it, I thought I wasn't mad at I mean, I'm just saying. This is a totally different situation, though. Yeah, this is, right. They okay. Were Cynthia asking. says that she has been nothing like but us. nice and can't believe the childish behavior and horrible harassment she's received from people she doesn't even know. Take a look. I went on my first date with Miguel on February 4th. 
And then five months later, we got married. I love it. It's the most beautiful ring I've ever seen. My relationship with Miguel is perfect, except for the issues with Candace and her mother. Candace and her mother act like they're teenagers, sending mean text messages and, and threats. They are needlessly malicious. Miguel's ex-wife, Candace, is a horrible person. If you took all the bad things you could think of and wrapped them into one person, that's how I see her. Early on in my relationship with Miguel, Candace was messaging me, telling me that Miguel was a bad person and that I needed to leave him. On Facebook, if you're not friends with someone, you have to pay money to send them a message. So not only did she go out of her way to message me, but she actually paid to do that. Candace and her mother are very disrespectful of my position as Miguel's wife and as Ellie's stepmother. I love Ellie. Even though Candace tries to keep Miguel away from Ellie, Miguel and I are going to do everything we can to constantly pursue his right to see his child. Well, thank you for being here. Yeah, you're uh, I appreciate it. This is Leah. Oh, nice to meet you. And this is, this is Candace. Nice to meet you too, Candace. Hello. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're the sitting there talking about the things that we've said. She says some things that she doesn't know anything about. She doesn't know anything about us, except for what he's told her. Well, and she he knows, might be a little biased. She I've knows seen a, things that you've written to him. Uh, why don't you tell them when I sent that text message? It's days after you dumped my daughter. So why are you acting like it's a daily thing? Why are you sitting there acting like it's a daily thing? Like whoa, we're whoa, whoa, wait a minute. She just got here. What are you doing? <laughs> What do you mean sitting there really? acting like? I'm what, about what, on the how, how is she acting like anything? She's just sitting there. I'm talking about on She just said Why that we harassed her. It's not okay for us to be upset. I just, I, can she you just, please she just said that? that we've been harassing her. I've never said one word to you. Can you please just explain to me why it's not okay for me to be upset? Because you have a daughter that's getting caught in the crossfire between your immature <laughs> exchanges with your husband. That's why. But it's not, but... No, there's no but. You said, tell me why it's not okay for me to get upset. I said, because your daughter's paying the price. She's caught in a crossfire between your sophomoric behavior with your husband and Cynthia. That's why we wanted to do this, because it's time it stopped. Because here's the That's thing. That's what I'm trying... You act like... You look like you don't believe me. It's absolutely <laughs> the truth. Dr. Phil, I've waited all my life to meet you. <laughs> I want your help. I seriously do. I if it's not all our fault. I'm not saying it is. I legitimately just want you, to You get heard past me say straight up that he needs to man up, not be intimidated by your ridiculous threats and name calling. Exactly. I know that that was not the right thing to do. And Ellie means more to us than I can even put into words. I don't, I, I don't want her to get to the point to old enough that she sees this going on. I want us to make sure well, we fix it first. Let me ask you a question. First. How would you feel if he had Ellie and was with his family and locked you out and threatened you if you came around? How would you feel about that? Um, Dr. Heart Phil, broken. I have thought about that. It would break my heart. I would want to die if that happened. I don't want that for them. I f have felt sorry for his mother because she doesn't get to be the... Gr and I know you might not believe it, but it's, it's the truth. I feel sorry that she doesn't get to be part of Ellie's life. You guys accused his mom of trying to kill Ellie. She turned the oxygen off. What would you call it? She it was on when I walked off. off, when I walked out of the room, she and it was off She admitted when I came it. Back she in. said you she the, did it. You she turned the off the oxygen. Together. Thank you. Why, 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 if reason. that was the case, though, why wouldn't you call the police? Because we couldn't prove it. Why wasn't there was no way to prove it. What were we going to do? Put her. Oh, believe me, we would have. So you no, can't. You can't talk about something you don't know because you weren't there. Thank you. Are you still in love with Miguel? God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Candace says that she has gone out of her way to include Miguel in his daughter's life. So does he know the latest information about his daughter? We'll find out after the break. The last time I visited my daughter, she was starting to make noises with her mouth, make little pops, and stand up on her own by pulling herself up. But I have not seen a single video or even a text message with information of what she is capable of doing right now. I have no idea whether Ellie can walk. I have seen her crawl across the bed, so I'm pretty sure she's scurrying around the floor, but anything past that, I have no idea.
Miguel says part of the reason he's here today is to find out how his medically disabled daughter is doing. He hasn't seen her in four months and blames his ex, Candace, for keeping him away. Candace says, hey, I have gone out of my way to be accommodating to Miguel, but he's just too wrapped up in his new life with his new wife. Everything that we're saying now needs to be said. I have lots of questions that I feel need to be answered. Which are? Such as, how long have you actually been with Cynthia? None of your business. <laughs> None of her business. She's but if I feel like she was cheating, he was cheating on me, why, why shouldn't I know that? What does that have to do with your child? You are now into co-parenting. Re see, the relationship didn't work. You got a divorce. Because right? he dumped her. But that's over. I know. This is not history class. This is Dr. Phil. History class is happening over at the high school. This is now. We're here. So you, you, you're, we're here talking about the child, and you say you want to know if he cheated on you. I don't. Did you cheat on her? I don't know. He, cheat on her. he says no. no. There's no cheating. There's no cheating. They say no cheating. Oh. One of the first things I ask you is that you seem like a woman scorned, and you said, oh, yeah. In I ways I am, but not in ways I am not because they're together. It has nothing to do with that. So you're scorned by someone else? No. I'm scorned because of the way he's treated me and he's acting like it's all my fault. It's not all my fault because it takes two to tango, doesn't it? He wasn't trying to come see her, but I wasn't necessarily trying to let him. It just doesn't make sense how this is, no, all no, seems like it's my fault. Nobody said it's your fault. I, see, I thought that the part about whether you were a good wife and husband was pretty much resolved with a divorce. <laughs> that you decided that wasn't working. And maybe he's a crummy husband. Maybe he... He's a great husband. Uh, he was crummy to her. Maybe he has grown up. Maybe he will be a better husband to you than he was to me. But please do not sit there and act like what I went through didn't happen. Because it did. I was there. You weren't. That I know of. <laughs> I've never met someone as mean as you. She is not mean. She's wonderful. <laughs> and you married somebody way meaner than she is. I think I would have figured that out. I'm only mean because easy now, easy now. he went running through the house one but, night when I was there being... screaming and cussing me out like I was a dog under his They feet. were taking my daughter away when she left you the first time. You are lying. She, the I'm only not thing talk to him she, anymore. He's lying. The only thing she said that night that you got upset about was okay. the fact that you, that she said, I came to see you and Ellie. That Who was then. This is now. If you love your daughter, and I know you do, then you need to decide that you want to work on getting past all of this anger and bitterness and co-parent actively. And there is no excuse, not drive time, not feelings of tension or stress or anything else that should be a high enough mountain or a thick enough wall to keep you from being actively involved in your daughter's life. You're right. And I think you do have a lot of unresolved conflict here, and, and I very much want to get you some help with I that. I would love that. Now, Candace sent us some video of Ellie that you haven't seen. I wanted to give Miguel an opportunity to see his daughter and one of her most recent milestones. Here you go. <laughs> Miguel. I miss my baby. That was at therapy. She gets therapy once a week with speech and um, physical and occupational. So I there you it. go. Thank you. She was a pound. One pound, nine ounces, 13 inches long. One pound, nine ounces at birth. Her body was and, the length uh, of my hand, and her little limbs would just hang off. And yeah. she has fought since the day she was born. That's why it's important that we get this She doesn't out. deserve this that we have, Miguel. We have to get past this. Well, I completely agree. I want to get past it. Well, I do. Weird. Well, listen, I am going to get you some help and support. Fair enough? Okay, next, it's been 10 years since this young man nearly stole my car. He was a guest I will never forget. And he's here and cannot wait to see how he's doing. We'll meet him right after the break.
Today's show has a little extra sentimental value to me because it is my 1,999th show. That's right. That means tomorrow is the big one, and it is full of surprises and updates from our most talked about guests over the past 12 years. But there have been so many memorable moments, there was no way they could all fit in one show, so I figured I'll start a day early. <laughs> when I first met Ryan 11 years ago, he was only eight years old and bravely battling leukemia. This little boy not only stole my heart, but also nearly stole my car. Take a look. Dear Dr. Phil, my name is Ryan. I am eight years old. I have leukemia, and it would be a dream come true to meet you in person. You were telling me you like, like, fast cars? Yeah. You and I are going to go out the back door, and I got a Formula One Ferrari out in the parking lot. <laughs> are you ready? Yeah. We'll be back, maybe. Was the best part of it all. It was awesome. Man, you're a crazy driver. Dr. Phil's show made me feel so much better. I almost felt like I wasn't on chemo. Well, joining me is Ryan's mother, Roxanne. Now, Ryan is celebrating eight years of being cancer free, correct? Yes. Oh, how great is that? <laughs> Ryan is here also. Ryan, come on out. Good to see you. Good to see you. So how's life for you, friend? Just turned 18, graduated high school. Wow. Uh, that, that's just great. Yeah. Now, Ryan made such an impression on me 11 years ago that I framed a photo of him, and it's hanging in a very special place in the studio. And that's a picture of you and I uh, in my Ferrari 360 Spider, and I hope you've never told your mother how fast we went. <laughs> uh, I valued that so much, so I made a copy of that for you. Uh, and I, you hope you'll hang that, uh, I hope you'll hang that in your house. We have partnered again with our friends at Expedia and Marriott for a week-long stay at the beautiful four-star Waikiki Beach Marriott, okay? <laughs> It's good to see you. Thanks so much. All right, my next guest, Tim, enraged viewers this year when he said in reference to his adopted son, Adam, I wish we actually drove past the hospital that day, went to the Humane Society, and picked up a couple of strays instead. Take a look. My son, Adam, is self-destructing before my very eyes. After Adam's drug taking, his violent behavior, and the DUIs, we said no more. You say he's an animal that belongs in a cage. Absolutely. I pulled a knife on my dad because I couldn't get their attention in any other way. I regret the day that we adopted Adam. Just six days ago, they had to bail him out of jail due to a felony arrest just so they could be here today. OK, Adam, you just came out and you threw a pill yeah. bottle at your mother. You said that you should have just drove past the hospital. You know what's something, Adam? That, that makes me what? feel really good. I think you need help with drugs and alcohol. This is a gift from us to you. You do your part, we'll do ours. Actions speak louder than words. Well, Tim, Adam, and Karen are here, and boy, how things have changed for them. So. Tim, talk to me here. Wow, wow. Different, different world? I wish there was something else other than just thank you. I can say to really thank you, truly, that what you've created for us. And well, got I appreciate back. your willingness to come here. Mom, has it, uh, does it feel different? It feels wonderful. We have our son back. And Adam, they tell me that you have worked very hard and very sincerely in everything that you've been about down there. I just wanted to say thank you to you, Ben, and Origins. You guys saved my life. I'm glad to hear that. And Ben, congratulations to you. And again, thank you for all the work that thank you did. Thank you. Also, a very special thank you to OnSite for helping this family. Next, her wedding day was a disaster when she fainted and blacked out right before saying, I do. And it was all caught on tape. And they redid their wedding right here on this stage. Find out how they're doing 10 years later. Did it stick? We'll find out after the break.
My wedding day was a complete nightmare. I blacked out, collapsed, and I fainted. Crystal says she's ready to conquer her fear of walking down the aisle once and for all. Dr. Phil gave us a chance to redo our wedding on television. I was a little bit nervous. Dr. Phil gave her some pointers to help her out. He told me just to relax and take deep breaths. Crystal, do you still take Brent to be your wedded husband? I do. Then you may kiss the bride. We've been married for 10 years, and we have two wonderful little boys. Dr. Phil, thank you for letting us renew our vows. It was a really special moment. That's great. Well, today's updates are just the tip of the iceberg, and tomorrow it is show number 2,000. Um, the entire audience will be full of past guests. We are bringing them in from everywhere. And you'll hear updates from the biggest news stories from over the last 12 years. From what's going on with Casey Anthony, to how the voice of Manti Teo, Catfish Hoax, Renaya Tuiasasopo, is handling life out of the spotlight. We'll find out how Todd Herzog, who went from winning Survivor China to barely being able to walk on this stage, is doing. Did he stay in treatment? Is he sober? We'll also update the most rebellious teens ever. Did they manage to turn their lives around? There will be updates on the most controlling spouses and in-laws ever. Yeah, you guessed it. Collude will be here. Plus, you at home will have a chance to win amazing prizes and vacations. You won't want to miss it. Now, also, I'm proud to announce that in three days, it is the live launch of Robin McGraw Revelation, Robin's own purpose-driven lifestyle brand. Uh, she will be premiering her skincare line on HSN's Beauty Report Thursday, April 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern, followed by multiple live appearances on Friday, April 11th. Also, Robin plans to make a special announcement on HSN regarding her foundation, When Georgia Smiled. Now, for a complete show schedule, you can visit hsn.com, keyword Robin McGraw. How excited are you? Oh, I am so excited. I can't believe it's almost here. I have waited three years to launch Robin McGraw Revelation, and to be able to do it exclusively with HSN is so exciting. And yes. I, I, it's, uh, it is, and it's so much fun. It's so much fun that, that when Georgia smiled is going to be part of all of this. Oh, I have and, a beautiful, beautiful announcement to make for the foundation. Yeah, and when Georgia smiled is, is Robin's foundation that is devoted uh, to helping women that are victims of domestic violence. Yes. And she's very active in that arena, and is going to be talking about it tomorrow. So we are excited for you. So happy. I want to thank all of my guests today and a special thanks to our medical team at Doctor On Demand for assisting some of my team in preparation for the show. If you at home want to have your own Doctor On Demand, an app that Jay and I have created, go to Google Play or App Store and you can download the Doctor On Demand app. Click your smartphone and you're eyeball to eyeball with a doc. Don't even have to leave your home. We'll see you next time. Thanks.